What's good, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the What's Good Games podcast, your source for video game news, commentary, analysis, and funny stuff. I'm Andrea Renee, joined by Ms. Christine Steimer. Oh, hello. Ms. Brittany Brombacher. Oh, hello. And very special guest, Trisha Hirschberger is here. Hi. I'm so happy to be here chatting with y'all. I'm so glad that we finally got you on the show. I have known Trisha for so long and had the pleasure of getting to work with you when we were both uh, doing stuff for Game Trailers and The Escapist magazine, uh, which feels yeah. like forever ago now. That was what, 2014? Maybe. Yeah, it does feel like forever ago. It's so funny to see how the industry's changed so much over the years. And when I say the industry, I pretty much mean like, digital content around video <coughs> games like I feel like that was still right on the cusp of like games journalism in print being the hot thing and that kind of changing over to more of like the let's play video content style um but yeah we worked in the same office for like a hot second I know and I was like I remember the first time I ran into you in the office I was just like can you just come into the office all the time <laughs> <laughs> thank you that was so nice yeah there's never enough ladies in the office i feel like no. i know those warp zone guys they were always just spilling over everything with all their props and their costumes and things everywhere they're um, so nice they are they are a lovely group of gentlemen over there so so tragic what happened with defy yeah. media and i was just gonna say if anybody's hiring and looking for some creative yeah. gold there's a lot of people looking for work right now yeah, a ton of people. Um, as always, if you guys are industry people listening to the podcast, because we know there's a bunch of you out there um, always lurking in the wings, never commenting on anything. If you do work in the industry and uh, you are looking for somebody, whether they be an editor, a video producer, a writer, an on-camera host, anything related to the to running YouTube channels, Twitch channels, or video games media, please uh, reach out to me directly, and I'd be happy to connect you with any of those people. Of course, contact at whatsgoodgames.com is the email address that's easiest to use. Um, so uh, for people that don't know Trisha, which it's kind of weird to think that anybody might not know you because you've been everywhere, um, she hosts a variety of shows. She's not only got her own Twitch channel, YouTube channel, and social media channels, but you also produce write and host for people like Geek and Sundry, New Egg, Kingston, Nerds with Kids. What else? What is, wait, maybe the question I need to ask you is, what haven't you done? <laughs> oh, that's so nice. I don't know. I, I feel like I have been very, very lucky to stumble and fall into this career where I get to talk about things that I'm passionate about for a living. Like people pay me to geek out about stuff and that's incredible. Um, and through that, I learned how to produce. I learned I, post-production, like all these things that were never really my passion in the first place. But I was like, oh man, if this means that I get to talk about gadgets and video games for a living, then I am on board. Sign me up. Um, so yeah, it's kind of spilled over into a lot of stuff. Movies, I'm actually hosting a Facebook show for Focus Features right now too. Um, but comics, cosplay, movies, like general fandom culture, a lot of tabletop gaming. All stuff that I grew up loving and never knew I could have a career in. I feel like kids nowadays are growing up being like, I want to stream video games for a living. And that is awesome. Because when I was a kid, that was not a thing. That was <laughs> oh, not no. a possibility. Um, so it's, it's very cool that there are so many different ways to have a career in something that I think previously people would have just considered a hobby. I mean, I didn't even know how games came to be i was like i love video games but no one works on these they just they just appear from ether right like <laughs> like it just what didn't never occur to me that this was such a massive industry when yeah. i was younger i yeah. would love to do some tabletop gaming with you get yes, andrea please. and Simon what do you play too. yeah oh, not play? not enough no, no no not enough that's the thing is i've only played a few things D D, and i okay. love it and it's so much fun we actually did it with some of our community members at pax east last year and had so much fun. I want to do Very more. Cool. I think I think Andrew's a little intimidated because she's not sure, like, because it went really fast. <laughs> she was well, like, yeah. you know, yeah. We, I we also threw, like we was out of my girl right into the fray. Yeah, I had no idea what I was doing. I was just like, I don't know any of the rules. 
of D&D and how to engage and what is acceptable and what is not. And people were like, just wing it. And I'm like, no, you can't just wing it. I need to know what the rules are. I'm just insight checking literally everyone. <laughs> like, that's what I did. I was just like, insight check, insight check. And see, I still don't I know do what that, that means. <laughs> and Andrea, you can get a, uh, like a digital PDF copy of the player's handbook. Read that book. And that will give you all the generals that you need. Because I am very much like you. I think the fun of D&D is not only in the improv, but also in the math and all the complexities because that makes it more real. So I love understanding the background of the game and how it came to be. And uh, fifth gen, which is what the current gen of D&D, is very streamlined. So it's super easy to understand. So if you read that one book, you totally get what was going on. See, I didn't even it's know there was a book. <laughs> There's a the lot general of idea that you could just try almost anything and your dungeon master should be able to make it work or not work, like work it into the story. Yes, I know. There's some okay. things to keep it based in the reality of the world that you're in, because if you could just make up whatever, like, mm -hmm. right. I don't know, and you were on the verge of death, you'd be like, and I just don't die. Like, I just right. stand right up because I didn't die. Like, there's things yeah. that have to All be right. play there, Got it. Uh, mostly to deal with combat, but things like insight checks and stuff like that, where based on your numerical stats from your character's background, it determines whether or not you're successful at a given challenge or attempt. Um, but yes, the basic understanding, if you have a good DM, you can just come in and play. Just improv, just wing it. And they'll let you know if you say something and they're like, well, you can't exactly do that. Or you have to make a roll for that or something like that. We yep. need to do more. That'd be so much fun. A lot of fun. Well, yeah, we are we already talking about doing more at PAX East. The conversation has begun. Are you going to be attending PAX East, do you think? Not that I know of. I have uh, severely limited my travel. Well, I'm sure having <laughs> a small time. child is uh, a yeah. good reason to stay home more often than not. Yeah, unless it's like a really, really worth it gig for me, I'll stay home. Um, not to say that I won't book something super awesome for PAX East and end up being there, but as of right now, no plans. Well, it is still, what, five months away, four months away? So we've yeah. got time. Uh, we'll keep our fingers crossed that you book something really cool so that way you can join us for some D&D because that would be really fun. Yes, yes, that'd be awesome. Um, so we're going to get into some news here in just a moment, but I want to give a big shout out and thank you to our special What's Good Games Patreon producer, Lincoln Davis from Polyarch. We are going to be doing his special producer segment at the end of the show that is all about VR. Surprise, surprise. Uh, you guys might know Polyarch as the developers of Moss, one of the many games that are being honored in the Game Awards nominees this year. So congratulations to them. And um, we have been revamping our merch store. Britt and I spent a bunch of time in there cleaning up a bunch of stuff, um, kind of getting the uh, merch store ready because we're going to be doing a Black Friday and Cyber Monday special, which we'll have more details about in next week's episode. So if you've been holding out on getting merch or if there's items in there that you're like, mm, I had my eye on that the first time but didn't pull the trigger, we're going to have some great shopping deals for you guys to talk about very, very soon. So maybe you want to go to teespring.com slash stores slash what's good games and just browse around and get your eye on what you want. And that way, when the deal is announced, you can just hit, click that buy button. Just food for thought. There you go. Um, all right, so. I'm totally not doing that right now, by uh, the way. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm very proud of all of the ladies options that we have in our store. So many of our favorite video game and nerd brands offer these unisex sizes that don't account oh, for breasts. That and that's, good. you know. Bullshit. So Those that's just the thing. Those always end up as giveaways on my Twitch channel. Yes, it's true. Night shirts. Yeah. Uh, like, hey, does anybody want a shirt? Or I'll just sleep in this, I guess. <laughs> yep. That's all that I do. But oh, wait. My shirt. Quick question. Yes. Are any of you ladies good at that magical uh, cutting a, a man's shirt Andrea up? Andrea so is. Super cute. Andrea. Yeah. I have learned the ways by watching many a YouTube tutorial. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, that is a superpower. I never figured that out. I cut them up and they just look like I cut a t-shirt. It right, is right, very yeah. easy good. to overcut. So you have to practice on a shirt that you don't care about to make sure uh, that you're cutting at the right places, particularly if you're cutting along the collar line. 
it's really easy to cut just even a half an inch too far and then it like falls off of you and you can't wear it anymore or you have to sew it up or you can uh-huh. but only for Hi. specific purposes <laughs> Okay. Touche. Touche. Um, I guess if that's your prerogative, then cut away as as much as you want. Um, It might be difficult to be um, kinky with it if it doesn't stay on at all, though. That's my point. (laughs) I guess you could drape it. I mean, I mean, we could go down a few rabbit holes yeah, right now. Yeah, I was now. like, I'm just gonna leave that. I got thoughts in my <laughs> head. I'll leave it. Okay. <laughs> your merch is awesome. Oh, thank, thank you. you. It's so good. Yeah, we have I'm some not even cool just stuff. That because I'm on your show. <laughs> 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 um, I'm wearing the zip up hoodie right now. It is very cozy because it is now getting cold all over the country. And I know I can't really complain about it being cold because I'm in California and people back home where I'm from, it's like five degrees right now. So no, thank you. Unsubscribe. Yeah, exactly. Um, but without further ado, now that we have introductions out of the way, We have quite a bit to discuss with the Game Award nominees. So on Tuesday, the nominees were announced. And as we've mentioned on the show before, we at What's Good Games are part of the nomination and voting jury uh, that look at all of the games out and that are eligible for nomination. And we make our selections. Our selections are then tallied up with 68 other outlets from around the world and Um, the board of directors over at the game awards takes a look at it all and says who has the most nominations in each of these categories. And that's who got announced. So let's, uh, let's take a look, shall we? So from the press release that was sent out earlier this week, it says leading the pack with eight nominations each Sony Santa Monica's God of War and Rockstar Games Red Dead Redemption 2 are both nominated for Game of the Year alongside four other titles Assassin's Creed Odyssey, the independent Ooh. Celeste, Marvel's Spider-Man, which has seven nominations. Assassin's Creed has four nominations and uh, Celeste also has four nominations. Monster Hunter World has three nominations and other notable multi-nominees include Epic Games Fortnite with four nominations and a trio of games with three nominations each Call of Duty Black Ops 4, Destiny 2 Forsaken and Detroit Become Human. Nominated content creators and streamers include Ninja, Pokimane, Dr. Lupo, Myth and Wily Rex. Nominees were selected by a global panel of 68 leading media outlets across enthusiast and mainstream media. Fans can help choose winners this year in all categories via online voting across several digital and social platforms, including thegameawards.com, certain award ca- Certain award categories can also be voted on directly via Facebook Messenger and Twitter direct message, and fans can talk to Amazon Alexa to vote for specific categories <laughs> and also use their voice to vote uh, the Game Awards action, which works with Google Assistant. This is all really wild. And an industry first, gamers will be able to select the winners in all categories of the Game Awards by voting in the official Game Awards Discord server, that's discord.gg slash the Game Awards, the server, which is open for fans to join now, will place um, will be the place to get the show info before, during, and after the awards. Voting will officially open uh, November 13th, so it's open now, and run to December 5th. So What a time to be alive, ladies and gentlemen. I know, gentlemen. right? <laughs> I can speak to the little device on my kitchen counter and tell her to vote for video games. I mean, if you can play Skyrim on it, Holy, this makes which sense. I did by the way we never not we won't derail Whoa. but I did do that and that was really was fun it? it was really fun I would highly 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 recommend it but I digress yeah this is cool so what's the easiest way to vote then is there a website you can go to did I miss that or the is game awards.com just... is probably okay. the easiest way to vote that sounds simple but yes. I mean maybe you're on if Twitter you all the time Discord. and you just want to <laughs> send a DM or maybe you don't want to vote for every category maybe you just want to vote for like your favorite fighting game or your favorite content creator um, you can just vote in single categories if you want I don't know what the restrictions are on voting uh, multiple times across multiple platforms I would imagine it's more like an American Idol style of voting where you can like vote as many times as you want (laughs) Um, i think you'd have to because like there's no way you'd necessarily be able to tell unless they somehow tie it to your ip address 
but uh, and then shout like out to everyone work. with VPNs, huh? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. There definitely be some way around it, but the important thing to remember is even though you as the public can vote and should vote for your favorites, that collective vote is weighted 10% to the 90% of the jury vote. So, um, needless to say, if there is an overwhelming favorite in a category among the jurors that that's probably going to win. But the thing that's crazy about this year is that I think a lot of these races are going to be split votes, even more so than last year. We saw, you know, Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild kind of sweep most of the awards last year, much to my sadness, Horizon Zero Dawn. Um, oh, no, RIP. I know, Our right? Um, so let's go over these nominees. So we already listed off the Game of the Year nominees for you. Uh, for best ongoing game, we've got Destiny 2, Fortnite, No Man's Sky, Overwatch, and Tom Clancy's Rainbow Six Siege. Best game direction, A Way Out, Detroit Become Human, God of War, Marvel Spider-Man, Red Dead Redemption 2. Best narrative, Detroit Become Human, God of War, Life is Strange 2, Episode 1, Marvel Spider-Man, and Red Dead Redemption 2. Best art It's interesting that Odyssey, sorry. It's no, go ahead. Quick. It's interesting that Odyssey wasn't nominated in, in any of those categories. In yeah. game direction and best narrative. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, we we nominated it, I think, in a couple of these categories. Um, it's it, it is always curious to me how a random game kind of sneaks in like a way out. That's this is the only nomination a way out has in all of the game awards is just for game direction. Um, which, I mean, doesn't mean that it doesn't deserve to be there. It's just always kind of a head scratcher for me as to why certain games show up like singularly, singularly in one category and not others. Or moreover, like what we've seen in previous years and even this year, why a game would be nominated for game of the year and then not nominated in any of the other categories. Um, but we'll discuss, um, in depth, some of these categories in just a second. Um, and I'm not going to read all of these categories because there are quite a few. Again, if you want to see all of them, thegameawards.com, particularly the esports categories, which we're just going to skip all together since we are not part of the esports jury. Uh, unless Trisha, you have a dying, burning desire to talk about esports. It sounded <laughs> no, like you're going to see no, a dying, not, burning not disease. Not particularly. <laughs> I, uh, I, I dabble as an esports fan, but I am by no means an expert in that world. Okay, then. Um, best score in music presented by Spotify, which is kind of a neat category to sponsor. Celeste, God of War, Marvel Spider-Man, Nino Kuni 2, Octopath Traveler, and Red Dead Redemption 2. Um, then we've got um, best audio design, uh, which we're going to skip over for now. Best performance, um, Brian Deckard as Connor in Detroit Become Human. Christopher Judge oh, as Kratos. Um, Melisanthi Mahout as Cassandra. Roger Clark as Arthur Morgan. And Yuri Lowenthal as Peter Parker slash Spider-Man. Um, that's going to be a tough one. That's I a mean, tough category. that's an impossible category, right? They're all so good. Uh, mm -hmm. Games for Impact, 1111 Memories Retold, Celeste, Florence, Life is Strange 2, Episode 1, and The Missing. Uh, best Indie Game, Celeste, Dead Cells, Into the Breach, Return to the Oberdin, and The Messenger. Um, and then uh, there's also Best Mobile Game, which has some interesting uh, nominations. Pitting a game as small and tiny as Florence up a behemoth like Fortnite is kind of interesting. Um, best VR AR game we're going to talk more about in the fifth or the, excuse, the fifth segment. The show's not that long. <laughs> How oh many my gosh. segments do we have? Uh, the third segment, um, but that's Astrobot, Speed Saber, Firewall Zero Hour, Moss, and Tetris Effect. Um, and then we've got kind of the individual categories, which we can kind of talk about um, as we go along. So, ladies, of the categories we've kind of talked about so far. What of these has stood out to you as a surprising nomination? I think for me, Game of the Year, Monster Hunter World being on there is a little surprising. And we were talking about this a little bit in our pre-show live stream. Yeah. I wonder if it's an international thing. Because like you said, Andrew, you made the point. This game is absolutely not going to win Game of the Year. I understand how for some folks personally, absolutely, it could be their personal Game of the Year. But critically, I just can't see that so um, it's kind of a head scratcher how this got here in the first place i'm not saying it wasn't a great game but i'm not being too hard on this am i are you understanding no 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 not really nominated weird. for much else yeah no like and that's out of 
the other biggies. Exactly. That's the thing that's really crazy. If you look down this list, uh, the game that the category we nominated for was best action game because that is a game that's focused on combat and Monster Hunter is literally all about hunting monsters. The narrative in that game is absolutely non-existent. And so I was also very surprised, Britt, when I saw this nominated because most of these categories, five nominees. Um, that's you know, the standard number for how many nominees game of the year got six. So that to me means that there was a tie somewhere in these nominees. Somebody was tied with monster hunter world, but it's not nominated for any other category except best role-playing game. Mm -hmm. And I would argue that I don't know how that's going to stack up against the other, other role-playing games in that category, I think it has no shot yeah. at winning Best RPG this year. There's just way too many good RPGs that are in that field. Uh, just as a reminder, Dragon Quest XI, Monster Hunter World, Nino Kuni 2, Octopath Traveler, and Pillars of Eternity 2. Ah, oh, it's the year yeah. of old school RPG. Yeah. yeah. I fucking love it. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. I mean, so go oh, ahead. Me, I would choose Octopath Traveler or Pillars of Eternity 2 Deadfire over Monster Hunter World in the RPG category. So... But just to echo what you said, like game of the year. Yeah, it's what? it's kind of Where a, yeah. Where did this come from? <laughs> and I it also does... thought it was interesting. If, you, if I have another thing to say, um, that <laughs> Detroit Become Human <laughs> didn't get games for impact. Uh, I mean, I understand like these other games definitely have a much more obvious impact. I would say, I would say, but Detroit Become Human, I thought also told a lot of interesting personal stories and. Was a very impactful game. Well, one of the reasons that we discussed, and which we'll go more into when we do our Game Awards predictions episode, which will be you know a, a standalone episode the week of the Game Awards, but one of the reasons why we didn't really nominate Life is Strange to episode one for a lot of things was because it's just episode one, and that game really I think is dependent on how all five episodes are going to come together. And so I, I think that the bulk of that game, Life is Strange 2, is going to be out in 2019. So I have to imagine we'll be nominating it for awards at this time next year for sure. But episode one, I think, didn't have as much of an impact as some of the other games that had released in their entirety in this year. And that's why I also was maybe surprised to see Life is Strange 2 episode one make it in there for games for impact and a game like Detroit become human didn't. I was kind of like, Hmm, that's a little I feel odd. Like life is strange. Even in the first episode though, kind of it shows its hand in the sense of like, we're going to be tackling the uncomfortable subjects that you might not want. Like that a lot of people sweep under the rug. Right. So I think in that way, and I, and I think it did it well. Um, so I think maybe that's why it kind of made it on there because there's also promise of, of what's to come. And I do think that that episode had a lot of heavy shit in it. Um, oh, absolutely. But that's what the games for impact category is for, isn't it? Yeah. That's what we're yeah, talking about. There. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Sorry. And for Detroit become human, I feel like the reason it probably didn't get it on there is, is because a lot of people felt it was too heavy handed. And I think when you become to overt with what you're trying to do, sometimes that message gets lost. That's like, fair. I feel like maybe that's why it didn't get those nominations. Uh, and Did maybe... you guys play a lot of those other games in the Games for Impact category? Because there's a few of them that I was like, I haven't even heard of that. Yeah, 11, 11 Memories Retold, I have not played or seen anything of at all. They reached out to us after the nomination submission was finalized, but I'm hoping a to get a chance to play it before we have to submit our final votes. Yeah, I think it just came out a week ago, and on Steam it only has 10 reviews. Like, I don't even like know a... if it's eligible then. Yeah, it's it, it was really surprising. Obviously it is if I made the list. <laughs> so the I know Andrea and Simon have played Celeste. We've all played Life is Strange 2 Episode 1. We've all played Florence. I'm only an hour or so into The Missing, which is the story from what I can tell so far about um, two girlfriends who are romantically involved, and one of them, they both go to sleep, one wakes up, girlfriend's missing and so she's trying to find her but the thing is is her body literally falls apart because of certain puzzles like you'll be walking and you'll have to break your arms and leg or break your arms so you can fit through a space and it's there's blood everywhere and then no, you come thank back. you 
you come back and they re- you can respawn them whenever you want, or you can be nothing but like a soul like crawling. Or it's it's very impactful. So I'm glad to see this one get nominated as well. Okay, it's very cool. shocking. And what's what's Florence on? That's not on Steam, is it? Is it's that on a iPhone game? or it, you're okay. just your phone? Sorry, just mobile in general. It's a, a mobile exclusive game. Okay. Highly recommend. I don't play any it's... mobile games, so I'm that's completely off my radar. You no, know, you should play either, it because it's so short. It's short, yeah. and really well told. You should play it. Okay, yeah. I'm I'm looking it up right now. Let's see if it's available for Android. I'm pretty sure it is because Annapurna Interactive published it, and they generally publish simultaneously yeah, publish both. Two ninety nine in the Google Play Store. If there's any Android so, viewers out there, so worth it. Exactly. Okay, cool. And um, just a, a, a quick apology to people who are watching on youtube.com slash what's good games. Um, I've been having some difficulty with Skype getting rid of the overlay, which you can see that it says Christine Steimer over Steimer's photo. Maybe um, people don't know who I am. Well, after, well, I have lower thirds up as well, though. So now you have double oh. lower thirds. Um, I mean, so yeah. just making sure. I'm going to fix it once we go to our first break or try to get it fixed. But for now, hopefully it doesn't bother you. <laughs> um <laughs> no. Yeah. So looking at this list, um, another game or another category that I thought was um, kind of interesting is the, let's see, where is it? It's the best multiplayer game category. So some usual suspects here. Obviously, we expected to see Destiny and Call of Duty here as, you know, giants in the multiplayer field. Um, obviously expected to see Fortnite. The two games that were a surprise to me for multiplayer were Monster Hunter World and Sea of Thieves. Now, I loved playing Monster Hunter World and being able to, you know, look at my squad and jump into people's games or have people jump into mine. But when it comes to multiplayer functionality and being best of the best, neither Sea of Thieves nor Monster Hunter, I think, really excelled here. And I think it's notable that PUBG is missing from this field when it dominated some of the nominations last year. Yeah. I think like you said, I, I'm not surprised though. I, the I only think PUBG thing I, had a rough year. The only thing I could say in kind of defense of Sea of Thieves is that maybe it's a different type of multiplayer because you're teaming up with a large crew of people um, mm-hmm. in not exactly a combative sense like a lot of the other multiplayer team games that we have up there you're just kind of going on adventures together so maybe that's why it was thrown in there um, yeah but people like come and steal your shit and like fuck with you and lock you in the brig but, like I, <laughs> I'm not surprised I'm not surprised to see Sea of Thieves on there as best multiplayer game because it is like that is the core function of that game is to mm-hmm. be Designed. It's a giant open sea filled with people. Filled with uh, assholes. It's an ocean of dicks. <laughs> that was a good throwback. That's to a good there throwback. Go. Last episode. Nice. Yes. Good job, Brittany. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh God. Um, Monster Hunter World. I I also understand in terms of concept, but I feel like when I was I didn't play this game because it wouldn't work on my Xbox. But Whenever I would talk to you, Andrea, or you, Brittany, neither of you were like, yes, it works very well. <laughs> it was mostly like we can make it through in order to get like playing with each other. But it was never like a seamless. Oh, it ex- wasn't. It was. Yeah, it wasn't seamless to hop in and out with friends. That's for sure. It was a very convoluted issue with the UI and whatnot. Um yeah, I mean, this isn't, I guess, th- none of this is really surprising. I went through all the games that we all nominated and submitted and highlighted the ones that made it and didn't make it. And the one that we nominated that wasn't selected was Overcooked 2. Oh, yeah. We're oh, Overcooked dude. 2 on this list. I think Overcooked 2 um, made a nomination for Best Family Game. Yes, a nominated is like, Best is, Family yeah. Game. I'm and like, then that is not a game mur- you want to play I with your family. People, I yes, play yeah, exactly. it's on Best Family. <laughs> but yeah, we nominated for that for Best Multiplayer. Like my 11-year-old cousin, they might get strangled. <laughs> <laughs> That's overcooked too. To I me. know. I, I get so bossy. <laughs> I don't you play have with to. anyone. Well, someone has to steer the ship. Someone's got to manage it. Um, it's I true. Totally it. I am also a bossy overcooked player. Um, the thing that surprised me, I would say, on here is that Shadow of the Tomb Raider is only nominated once. 
that's surprising to me. Um, mostly because for me, I look at it from like the technical advancements in that game and what that game looks like. And I mean, that was like our premier game to show off ray tracing technology and PC gaming. And so I expected it to see make more of a splash from that angle, but I guess people just weren't digging it so much. It's nominated for best action adventure and then that's it that I can see. Yeah, I think yes, that I that game suffered tragically from being under the wheel of Spider-Man. And it was really unfortunate because, you know, we, um, well, I personally did a lot of work with the Tomb Raider team over the convention season, hosting multiple panels for them and really kind of getting to know that team. And I was super excited for that game and I really enjoyed it. You know, um, from start to finish, I thought it was a really well done game. And as you mentioned, made some significant improvements in the franchise, adding things and really kind of balancing out the action and the exploration, especially that new um, difficulty slider system that they put in that really lets you tailor the experience to your personal play style. But I think that what it just suffered from was that there was just so much competition in that kind of open world action adventure space this year that there was just not enough people that played it. That's probably what it came down to. Yeah. I would say that, and I love Shadow of the Tomb Raider. I think it's my favorite Tomb Raider game, but I feel like it didn't do anything remarkable. It didn't reinvent itself like God of War did, for example, and Spider-Man. But I'm with you. Like Personally, it's one of my top games of the year. It was really fun, but I think from a critical perspective, it makes sense. Yeah, is there any kind of category for um, specifically like visual tech? You know, Any game or graphics. The only there used to be a best animation category, I think, oh. uh, like in the first year of the Game Awards. I would have to go back and double check that. But right now, um, there is there's only, art direction, best yeah. art direction for outstanding creative and technical achievement in artistic design and animation. I think that's the closest we have. Yeah, I'm surprised not to see a nod there. Not that I think it would have beat out God of War, which I thought just looked absolutely stunning, or Red Dead for that matter, or Odyssey. Um, we've just we've been very lucky this year. It's been a yes. good year. It's, we've been yes. blessed. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it is definitely a good year to be a gamer. Um, I'm trying to look at these other um, categories. One of the um, categories that I thought was really difficult for us when we were kind of thinking of nominations was the difference between a best action game and best action adventure game because it feels like so many of these games split the fence there that they are both and that you could qualify them as both. And that's um, something that we really struggled with. Does it make sense that a game like Far Cry is considered only an action game and not an action adventure game? No, I mean, because action adventure here is described the best action adventure games combining combat with traversal and puzzle solving. I mean, there's a hell of a lot of traversal in Far Cry 5. Puzzle solving, not so much. It seems like best action game translates to best shooter. If you look but at Dead Cells isn't a shooter. Well, I'm saying, though, because if you look at the games nominated, Call of Duty, Black Ops 4, Dead Cells, Destiny 2, Far Cry 5, and then, I guess, Mega Man 11, that doesn't count. So, well, Dead Cells, well, Dead Cells really is also not. It's like Dead Cells is a side-scrolling, sort of like a right. Metroidvania kind of. So, action yeah. shooter category? I don't know. That was confusing. It's weird. Yeah, I guess, I don't know. If you're trying to differentiate between action and action-adventure game, to me, I would think about the play mechanics. Like, which games had the better action mechanics? And then I put them maybe in the action category. But you're right. It definitely crosses lines. Yeah. That's it's messy. I think they just keep it there so that they can nominate more games. <laughs> Something That's interesting to note is that when we submitted our ballot, we submitted nominations for best handheld game. And oh. we actually, technically, for What's Good Games... Uh, deferred on this category because we did not have the minimum three games required to submit a nomination in that category. And we struggled with this last year because we said, isn't this just essentially like the best Switch game category? And the Game Awards clarified to us that um, Switch is considered a mainstream console is not considered a handheld only. So I was like, oh. so basically you're talking about best 3DS game. 
But what I'm yeah, noticing mobile here already has its own category, right? But I'm noticing here that the best handheld didn't make it. So I'm guessing that many outlets <laughs> like us probably did not submit because there just haven't been enough 3DS exclusive titles that have been released in order to, you know, garner a nomination, which I think is indicative that the 3DS's life cycle is probably at its end. I mean, wah, wah. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. I mean, Switch is. Switch is killing it on all fronts. Like when you said best handheld, immediately my thought was Octopath Traveler. Yeah. Um, right. But you you can certainly dock it in TV mode and play it on a TV. So I guess not. I I don't know. Yeah. My Switch has never been docked. <laughs> Ever? Wait, never? Ever. Never. Poor thing. Uh, poor thing. It just I wants to rest mine. in its cradle every once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> I only dock mine for streaming, if I'll be honest. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. It's the only time. I don't know. All I know is I'm docking the shit out of that bitch when Pokemon comes out on Friday. You gotta play, play it on, on the big screen. 120 inch. Let's go. Oh, my God. Got it. Wait, which which mm-hmm. uh, which Pokemon are you gonna get, Britt? I have Pikachu. Jason has Eevee. But we're gonna play what I want to play, which is gonna be Pikachu. Okay. Pikachu. Just because, like, yeah, like I I've never. I get that Eevee's incredible because it can turn into a million different things, but I just don't have that obsession with Eevee that I feel like the rest of the world has. To I be have honest, the Eevee obsession. I get that Pikachu's iconic, but, you know, eh, give me coughing. Give me lo- Pikachu. Like, yeah, give me Pokemon. I Let's love go how coughing. much you love coughing. You love the most toxic <laughs> Pokemon. I love the derpy, the derpy ones. But anyway. I wish you had your coughing with poison. you so we could see it, but it's not there, I'm I guessing. Know. No. Um, one th- last thing I want to touch on before we move on to some other news, um, because we don't want to spend the entire segment on the Game Awards, um, is the content creator of the year category. So clearly this category has changed uh, since the last, what, four years? As you guys are aware, I was nominated in this category last year when it was called Trending Gamer. And due to all of the fiascos um, around the category, basically meaning the popularity contest that that category ultimately became about like whose audience is the biggest that can gather the most amount of votes and not about the actual content itself, the Game Awards decided to change this category. But I would argue it's probably (laughs) still the same that it was. Um, there's also a separate um, content creator for good nomination process that the Game Awards did this year that I imagine they're going to be giving out as a single award that's not voted upon that the Game Awards uh, selection committee is going to look at all of the submissions and go, this is the person that we want to give that um, award to. It's not going to be voted upon, which is probably the right call that they yeah. kind of editorialize that award, much like a like a whatever uh, what's, I'm trying to think of like a lifetime achievement award kind of category, right? Where that's not voted upon or there's a, no kind of metric that decides that. That's just like the editorial choice of the people who run the awards. But the content creators that are here are pretty much all streamers. And I thought it was interesting because somebody wrote into Games Daily earlier this week asking are streamers really content creators? And would you consider somebody, you know, how could you put somebody who just turns on their computer and starts playing a game, how can you compare them next to somebody who does gameplay capture and editing and graphics work and all of that? And I was like, this is an interesting idea because I've been in the content creation business for quite a long time. And I, of course, wholeheartedly would say, absolutely streamers are content creators. You don't just turn on your computer or your console and start streaming. That's not the way it works. I mean, you can do that, but that's not how you become a successful streamer. There is so much more that goes into building your audience, creating programming, deciding what kind of games you want to stream, working with PR in the background, et cetera, et cetera. But I wanted to get your ladies' opinions as fellow creators about what you think about this category and who's in it and really what the phrase content creator means. I I appreciate this category. I'm wondering if going forward, though, it should be called Streamer of the Year and maybe Influential Gamer Doing Awesome Things for the Industry. Sorry, I know this is now answering your question, but I'll get to it, I promise. Um, like, Influential Gamer Doing Amazing Awesome Things for the Industry. And if you look at some of the folks that we nominated, 
like Steven Spawn from Able Gamers, Khalif Adams from Spawn on Me, people who are doing some really good work for this industry and the health of this industry and the culture of this industry. Um, that's just my little rant. I feel like we need to kind of split this and define these two different categories. But again, I'm going to echo exactly what you said, Andrea. I agree. It's not like you're just turning on a computer and talking about a game. Like you can do that, like you said, but it's so much effort that goes into that to make it constant that people actually want to consume and you're putting out content. So damn it. That is content creation. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm going to echo that. I think that for me, at least as a creator, anything that I live stream is heavier on the pre-production end versus anything that's pre-recorded. And then I have a ton of post-production to do. There's still both a lot of work. Exactly. Different types of work. So I would definitely say that they're all creators. Um, but the, you know what it makes me think of? It makes me think of in uh, in the Streamy Awards, they always have Creator of the Year, Channel of the Year. And uh, for a while, they were also separating into Audience Choice Creator of the Year, Audience Choice Channel of the Year. And I think some years they even made those just Audience Choice Awards, which is a little bit more transparent because I think that communicates, hey, whoever's following is the biggest. Like whoever can motivate their people is going to win the audience choice award. And it's still the audience choice creator of the year or whatever you want to name it. Um, but maybe that's a little bit more uh, communicative of what the award actually is. Steimer, any thoughts? Just a, just a plus one to what Trisha just said. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I mean, I think we all know that this is Ninja's award to lose anyway because he's just been so on fire this year that anybody nominated against him is unfortunately probably, like, doesn't have a chance. Even though a um, friend of the show, Greg Miller, likes to remind everybody that he won against PewDiePie. Um, so yeah, but PewDiePie <laughs> also didn't, I don't ever think, ever talk about it. Yeah. Why would he? He was too busy counting his pile of money. Yeah. So like Ninja, Ninja could lose here if he doesn't care about it. Do you think so? Right. Like who do you think he yeah, would lose I, to? I mean, whoever cares the most. Again, like it's just like if one of these other people is like, no, I'm going to actually campaign for this and yeah. tell my audience to go constantly that and Ninja is just never talking about it. A lot of those kids aren't going to watch the game awards. Like his audience is very young. So unless he tells them to do this, they aren't going to find this on their own. That's so like, fair. If, if he doesn't activate, then uh, he could lose it, but it would be similar. Yeah. To Greg's one against PewDiePie where it's like, it's really just cause you didn't give a shit. <laughs> That's true. Well, and that's that's the case with a lot of awards like this. Like, I had a friend who was obsessed with being on FHM's Top 100, and she, like, campaigned hard every day, the whole dang thing, and did really well because of that. But I'm sure there were other people on that list that were like, eh, that didn't mm -hmm. do so well because of that. So it's, you know, like I, like I said, audience choice, I think, is a clearer picture of what's going on. Mm -hmm. Yes. I yeah, I, I was definitely disappointed to see some of the people that we nominated didn't make it on the list, but not surprising. And, all, and just for the record, not discounting any of the people who got their nominations. Mm -hmm. These are all creators that have been in the space for a long time. Some of them have mm -hmm. just had some crazy meteoric rises in this past year and absolutely deserve it. Um, I just recently um, started looking at some of Myth's content. Um, obviously, he's been creating content for quite some time, but he, like Ninja... Um, became a Fortnite creator early in the year and went from like 100,000 subs in January to you know, millions of subs and followers now, which is crazy to think about because generally that takes brands, you know, years, not months to create that kind of a following. So it's going to be interesting to see um, how this content or how this category is going to change at this time next year because it was quite a diverse field of people, I think, in the Trending Gamer nomination um, selection mm -hmm. last year versus here. I think these people, while obviously diverse as people, all kind of make similar ish content. Um, mm -hmm. meaning they all kind of stream the same types of games in their space. Well, for the most part, I don't want to overgeneralize, but, um, good luck to all of the nominees. Of course, the game awards happening Thursday, December 6th, 
Brittany and I will be there. And so we'll try to um, maybe vlog or something from the Game Awards to uh, give you guys some content. But keep an eye out for our Game Awards special episode where, of course, we encourage you to play along as we pick our favorite winners. So moving on to some other news before we go into our first break quickly here. I just wanted to touch on this. We don't need to talk about it too much, but I thought it was fascinating that the U.S. Army wants to attract more soldiers by fielding a Fortnite team. And this uh, write-up comes from Polygon. Hey, listen, they're down on numbers. They need to recruit somehow. As first reported by Stars and Stripes, an independent news organization with operates from within the Department of Defense, the Army eSports team is currently accepting applications from active duty personnel, reservists, and veterans. An online form indicates that there is an interest in fielding teams for Fortnite, Call of Duty, Tekken, League of Legends, Player Unknown's Battlegrounds, Overwatch, FIFA, and the Madden series, along with NBA 2K franchise. In an interview with an Army recruiting station in Slidell, Slidell, Louisiana, Staff Sergeant Ryan Moe said the goal was to use esports in furthering the Army's brand and boosting recruitment. And that will begin in December with an internal Tekken 7 tournament. The winner will represent the Army at PAX South in January 2019. Can we hold the phone? The <laughs> army has an esports team. I did not know. This is amazing. I kind of love it. I'm way into it. Like, way to go. I think that's great. Also, it makes me feel very Ender's Game. Like, oh, I feel God. like I'm using oh. it in recruitment. Oh, <laughs> I didn't even oh, think about it that really way before. You. <laughs> it's real now. So good. Wow. What um, a time to be alive. Hey, you know yeah. what? We need to get people in. Young people are not motivated at all to join the armed forces. And I don't necessarily blame them. I mean, my mom, I come from a military family. I've said this multiple times on the show. My mom was in the Air Force. My grandfather also was in the Air Force. When I was getting ready to graduate high school, my mom gave me the pitch of like, hey, right out of high school, I went into the Air Force. You could consider a mil go joining the military and getting your college paid for and, and going into media relations in the military because she knew I wanted to be uh, going to journalism and on camera TV reporting. She's like, people in the armed forces have to do that. And I was just like, yeah, but boot camp, mom. <laughs> No, legit. So my, uh, I also come from a military family. My dad was in the Navy and he, like he, I would love to have seen him in boot camp because he and I are very similar personalities. And that like, if someone is yelling at me or telling me what to do, I'm like, fuck you, leave me alone. <laughs> um, and, like, we do not respond well to that. And he actually, I think, tried to get out of going through boot camp <laughs> and they're like, no, get the fuck out. Like you're doing it. And he was like, shit. Okay. Fine. I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. And when the crazy part now is that people pay to go to boot camp. <clears throat> Berries. Um, just saying. Oh, hey. <laughs> 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 that was good. That was a good zinger. Um, I did that this morning. Uh, I know when you texted me at 5.30 a.m., I was like, she must be going to Barry's. <laughs> Jesus Christ, girl. Yes. I respect you. Um, so I just thought that this was interesting that um, they're using esports and video games to recruit. Hey, more power to you. Use whatever tool you have necessary, uh, you know, at your disposal to get people involved. It is a great honor to serve this country. And I think not enough young people consider it, um, myself included. So uh, next story. Couple ordered to pay Nintendo 12 million dollars for running illegal rom sites so this write-up comes from game informer an arizona couple jacob um matthias 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 and uh That's christian nice. matthias have been ordered to pay over 12 million dollars to nintendo for running pirated rom sites loveroms.com and loveretro.co the couple admitted to copyright and trademark infringement and allegedly settled on the lofty judgment rather than risk losing more in a suit Nintendo brought forth in July. Many have speculated that the high figure is meant to deter other sites from offering pirated ROMs, and indeed, many other sites have shut down following Nintendo's legal action. Love ROMs once offered pirated ROMs of games like Pokemon Yellow, Donkey Kong Country, and Mario Kart 64. The site has since shut down and now only offers a simple message titled, Apology to Nintendo. 
The, oh, whoops. <laughs> the ruling is a major coup for Nintendo who will take ownership of the sites and receive all Nintendo games and hardware still in the couple's possession. The ruling also included a permanent injunction ensuring the couple will not infringe on Nintendo's copyrighted material ever again. I have what? the apology. Wow. I have the apology okay, okay. right here. Do it. <clears throat> Someone needs to play some very sad music behind me. Oh. Our website, loveroms.com slash loveretro.co, previously offered and performed unauthorized copies of Nintendo games in violation of Nintendo's copyrights and trademarks. Loveroms.com slash loveretro.co acknowledges that it caused harm to Nintendo, its partners, and customers by offering infringing copies of Nintendo games and has agreed to cease all such activities. To access legitimate Nintendo games online, please visit www.nintendo.com for information about the Nintendo no game store. Wow. Wah, wah, wah. Wah. This so, feels to me like, okay, I'm going to take it way back, but this feels to me like when people started getting busted for downloading music on Napster. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah, because you thought like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know it's illegal, but like everybody's doing it and you know, from your pursuit, you're like, I'm not hurting anyone, so it's cool. And I'm sure like this couple was like, Hey, I figured out how to do it. No big deal. So I think this is a huge coup for Nintendo and it definitely might make other people think twice. Oh yeah. So can many other websites. Million dollars? Yeah, can we talk can dollars? we talk about this number for gonna- a second? They agreed to settle agreed to settle on 12 million dollars either this is going to completely bankrupt this couple and nintendo knows that they're never going to be able to collect this money they're just doing it out of principle or they made a hell of a lot of money running roms on the internet so i was like are they selling them i thought they would just be giving them as freeware I don't know how that. I don't know they're, if they're selling probably. Them or not. My guess would be giving them as freeware, but maybe running ads on the site and making uh, money maybe a running ads on the site. Maybe. So I was I was looking into this, and it sounds like obviously number one, I think this is a scare tactic to say, hey, motherfuckers, you're gonna keep doing this. We are going to uh, sue you for twelve million dollars, or you'll settle for twelve million dollars. And obviously, other websites are probably now second guessing their ROM business. But also, it sounds like this is what you see on paper behind the scenes, behind closed doors. They actually will probably settle for much, much less. And that's typical in these sorts of things. I was reading an example where someone was sued for 18 million and they settled for 4 million, which, don't get me wrong, that is still an enormous amount of money that many people will never ever see in their entire life. But I'm sure that's just one example. I guess of how this is more of a scare tactic probably than anything else. Sure. But of course. I mean, yeah. go ahead, Brittany. So it says they already settled on it. Right. So my understanding is, is that this is what they're settling on, but behind like, this isn't actually what they're going to end up paying out. I don't know if that's actually how it works. I don't know, but that's I mean, what people the, are saying. I think it's only that they can't pay it. Cause I don't think even if you ran ads on this site that you would have made $12 no. million dollars on fucking Garnish ads. That's a lot of money. <laughs> A lot. Uh, according to the final judgment, the so if you click on the, one of the links in the story there, it takes you to the actual plaintiff versus uh, Jacob Matthias and Christian Matthias, husband and wife, Matthias Designs LLC. Um, it says that the amount, the total amount, plaintiff is hereby awarded judgment against all defendants jointly and severally in the amount of $12,230,000. And then here's the read up from Torrent At least Street. it's the LLC, right? So, like, it's going to damage. It's not that. So, it'll bankrupt the LLC, and then yes, the right. Nintendo will never actually see this money, would be my guess. Correct. So right, just for exactly research it. purposes, I just looked up uh, a site that is like loveroms.com. So mm-hmm. I'm currently sitting on emulator.online. No, don't tell them what it is. They're going to listen to it and <laughs> shut it down. Well, I, a quick Google search game. It was not hard to find. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure Nintendo's uh, legal has a, a, a comprehensive list. <laughs> I'm sure they do. Yeah, you can pick which console uh, library of games you'd like to access. And play the ball right through the website for free using Flash. There you That's go. That's what's yeah. going on right there. Obviously, you know, this is Nintendo. It's their company. These are their properties. They have the right to do anything they want, however they want. I also think that it raises, and, you know, I guess I'm looking at it from a consumer perspective, where if people want to play these games, if people want to play these old school Super Nintendo games, and they have no other means to do it, 
what do you think is going to happen? People are going to buy the emulators. People are going to buy the ROMs. They're going to buy the cartridges and put them on their Super Nintendo. I mean, I've done that with Mother 3 because, uh, hello, it has, has not come out yet. Nintendo, what are you doing? You. Don't That's do it. fine. It's fine. If I, if I have to bankrupt this company because of Nintendo ROM, it's okay. What? Wow. No, what? Just Brittany? <laughs> Man, going hard. How it's dare you? It's okay, baby girl. We'll have this conversation oh off camera. Okay. No, <laughs> oh, but how you want to bankrupt us? Over other, over Mother Three, I am so passionate about Mother Three. No, I'm I, not. I, no. Please don't bankrupt us, Nintendo. Please love us. Just send us copies of your games. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's it's unfortunate <laughs> because I mean there are so many quality old Nintendo titles out there, and especially with a lack of virtual console on the Switch. I mean, you can get the NES Classic, the SNES Classic, and there are some fantastic games on there, but those aren't going to be updated with other games. And it sounds like right now your best bet is to get Nintendo Switch online and then just play whatever Nintendo uploads there. I wish there was a super-duper easy solution. I wish this was considered to be okay, because if people want to play games that came out in 1995 that they can't buy anywhere else, then I'm, I don't know. I'm with you in the sense that Video game preservation and historical video games are an issue that we as an industry need to address. There are a couple champions for video game history and maintaining that we need to keep a comprehensive library of all of the video games ever created, and that's difficult to do. And it's challenging when Nintendo has a ruling like this because you would hope that maybe they would designate somebody as like the historian of Nintendo games to be like, we're going to keep a ROM of every single Nintendo game ever published. And this is the one source that you can go to. And that perhaps they have like a, a royalty system in place, right? Where Nintendo says, we're going to take the bulk of these profits and we're going to pay a royalty to the people to maintain this library and to maintain the site. I would like to see something like that occur maybe. Yeah. Because I'm, I'm with you that... There, we don't want to lose some of these games to time, you know. There's so many um, preservation or ways to preserve other forms of media, whether it's music or movies or books. But video games is a lot more challenging just because of the type of medium it is. So I hope that this doesn't affect or have ripples in that sense as far as preserving games for historical purposes. But we've seen Nintendo develop aggressive monetization strategies for their content creator program on platforms like YouTube. So it's not surprising at all to me that they're like, this is mm -hmm. our content. If we're not making the money off of it, nobody's making money on it. But and maybe there's some kind of $12 million. Yeah. But maybe some kind of profit sharing thing is in place. Well, Nintendo comes in and says, yo, we're going to take like 95% of your profits from this and we'll give you just enough to keep it running and maybe a little extra. Maybe that would be a solution, but I don't know. I don't think so. They're a Japanese company. I'm sure they're just like, give us our money. It's our product. And like, to be quite honest, they like, can do that. Yeah, it's their thing. They made it. Yeah, they, they created can, it. They can do that. And there are a ton of people out there that have made their own NES classics for better use of it, where they just bought a Raspberry Pi, put a ton mm -hmm. of ROMs on there, and have their own little mini system. Um, so it's definitely a problem that if Nintendo wants to crack down on it, I guess their only resource is intimidation. Yeah. Yeah. You know? So I Just guess uh, watch your, your back picture. if you've got a ROM site. Um, <laughs> I want to I wanna keep moving here because um, we have three more things to cover before we get to the break. that so we got to try to cover them <laughs> relatively quickly. Um, holy shitballs, Detective Pikachu. Brittany, take it from here. Oh my god. All right, so that is all of my commentary. Okay, this comes from Polygon. The new trailer for Detective Pikachu doesn't just bring the world of Pokemon games to life. It gives us a new glimpse uh, of how the real world would look if the creatures walked among us in everyday life, my life goal. And it means that and that means incredibly realistic Pokemon, very very realistic Pokemon like oh my god, I didn't realize Pikachu would have hair. Pokemon. Of Detective course he would have hair. You think he's going to be like a lizard? What do you think his skin texture is? <laughs> He's a mouse. Of course he is for Detective Pikachu is based on the Nintendo 3DS game of the same title, which showcased a new side of the Pokemon world, one where Pokemon solve crimes instead of battle. The trailer shows Tim, the main character of the game, searching for his missing father before he stumbles upon a very particular Pikachu who can talk. The catch? Only Tim can understand the Pikachu. The two embark on a mission to find Tim's dad. Cue adventure, hijinks, and more real-looking Pokemon. 
The iconic Pikachu is voiced in motion captured by none other than Ryan Reynolds, and Tim is played by Justice Smith of Jurassic Kingdom, Fallen World. Ken Watanabe, did I say that right? Watanabe. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm terrible. That's okay. Detective Yoshida, Rita Ora, Suki Waterhouse, and Bill Knighty fill out the Bill Knighty. Side of the cat. Knight. Knight. I thought I saw it. my contacts aren't working. No, no, it's okay. It's all good. <laughs> While there have been no okay, while there have been many animated Pokemon films, legendary pictures, Pacific Rim, Godzilla is the first company to realize Pokemon aside a lot of action cast, and it comes out May 9th, twenty nineteen. Anyway, holy shit! Just balls. in time, it's my birthday weekend ish. So hell yeah, I'm Let's get drunk so, and go watch. So Detective excited! Pikachu. I did not think I was gonna like this movie at all, and then I saw the trailer and was like, oh my god! I think I have to start playing Pokemon now, so I understand about the Pokemon in this movie. No, no, yeah. you don't have to play. That's the thing is you don't have to play Pokemon to understand this movie. Because if we were if we were talking about the very first Pokemon Pokemon movie or some of the recent ones that have come out, I would say, sure, you're going to be like, what the hell is this cheesy bullshit? And I'm going to say it's glorious cheesy bullshit, but it's probably not for you. This, I think, is going to appeal to people like you, Andrea, who are like, Pokemon, eh, oh my god, this movie makes me want to play the game. And I think this is going to be the perfect gateway movie. I think this movie is going to end with Ash Ketchum. Calling Ooh, it right now. No. Ooh. No. No. Yes. Because in this world, they don't battle. Yeah, the, there's battles in the in the trailer. Oh, is it just is it just that the it's this the, guy doesn't it's, battle? It's the arena. Yeah, this guy doesn't battle. If you because if you're if you watch the trailer, there are well, he posters talks about being his, a trainer. Yeah, oh, there is a there is an arena. You're right. There's an arena, and there are posters on the wall of like Steelix versus Onyx or whatever it was. I can't remember. So I think this game, at this movie, as the credits roll, you're gonna see someone. And they're gonna be like Ash Ketchum, and he's gonna turn around, and we're gonna be like, Oh my god! And then she's gonna hit the fan. <laughs> it's gonna be so good. Be it like but a post credit scene or something. I'm so excited if you can't tell. Yeah, so this game detect is based off of Detective Pikachu, which is the game that came out in 2016 in Japan. It came out March of this year in the U.S., and it takes place in Rhyme City, which is known for its Pokemon carnival it has every year. And it is lore that Rhyme City is within the same world as all the games that we have played. We don't know the exact location of it, so it'll be interesting to see how they tie this in. And oh my god, I am so god damn excited <laughs> i love how a lot of people on social media were equating pikachu with a friendlier version of ted the uh, cuddly oh, yeah. animated teddy bear that was voiced by seth MacFarlane. if you guys ever saw that movie which i yep. i love ted um and i was like I'd never thought about it that way, but it does kind of feel that way because Ryan Reynolds just has that quippiness in his delivery and his comedic timing that feels so good. And then I saw somebody tweeted to me, um, Pika Pool, and it was this 3D model of Pikachu in a Deadpool suit. I got it. Because Ryan Reynolds, of course, it also plays Deadpool. And I was like, oh, Also dude. played Green Lantern. This man just does whatever he wants. Well, no. <laughs> if you watched Deadpool 2, they wrapped that whole thing up. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, I have yeah, They, like, erased that from existence. Yeah. Oh. It's really oh, funny, actually. Also, next time you're in town, let's watch Deadpool 2. It's super good. Sounds good. Super yeah, good. Super good. Oh, my God, though. I'm just so excited. That's all. In the trailer, they have, like, 20 different Pokemon. You see all of them all looking it's realistic. Crazy. Oh, my God. Like, Jigglypuff. <laughs> Like, this should not work, right? On paper, this shouldn't work. This should be a fucking trash fire. But it looks so good. I was, like, super excited watching this trailer. Yeah, it really does work well. And I agree with you, Cyber. I, even though I played over in my head, I'm like, this still should not work. This still should not work. But by the time work. I saw the end of the trailer, I was so, I was like, oh, my God. I was is, super hyped. This is going to work. And it's just. Oh, I don't know. I think this is just really cool. I mean, I've, I've enjoyed all the other movies we had, the, all the animated ones, but to see Pokemon do something like this, and I feel like it's going to have a lot of references in it that are adult references that maybe the children will understand. That's just kind of the tone I'm feeling from this. I feel like it's not going to be the super cheesy friendship can overpower anything movie. It's going to be more realistic and especially with Pokemon. Wait, what do you mean? You think friendship can't overcome any problem? I mean, I, I am a realist, I'm an optimist, but I'm not stupid. No, I can't. <laughs> I don't oh, know. No. It's going to be so good. It's going to be so good. And like I said, Mr. Mime has hair on his head. He tells Pikachu to shove it. I'm just all about this. All about yeah. it. 
Oh, 100%. Pokemon's oh. a very beloved IP, so it's the right time, I think, to Dude. go this route and cash in on it for Hollywood. Yes. With this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right now, the mar- releasing the trailer right now, but for Pokemon Let's Go, brilliant. This is coming out next May. Rumor is the next Pokemon game's coming out next holiday season. It's just going to be fucking awesome. Get hype. We will definitely <laughs> be going to see this for sure. Um. Now, I'm going to just briefly mention this because we didn't get a lot of news about it, but Harry Potter Wizards Unite new details emerged this week. So this is the game. Um, So this is right up comes from um, IGN that Niantic and WB Games have officially announced that Wizards Unite will arrive in 2019 and release a new trailer and website that reveal a little bit more detail about the game. The game places players in the role of witches and wizards working for the statute... The Statute of Secrecy Task Force, aiming to erase traces of magic from the muggle world to stop the calamity. You will hone lightning fast wand reflexes, reads the website, an ability to sniff out the faintest whiff of magical disorder from afar and proficiency proficiency in advanced casting of multiple spells. The trailer shows a witch casting an immobilizing spell on a rogue golden snitch, so it's not hard to see how Pokemon Go's caption mechanics could translate. So we were super excited about this game when it was first announced. The idea that we're essentially getting a Harry Potter Pokemon Go. It's from Niantic, the people who make Pokemon Go. So it's not like a knockoff game. This is like the real deal. And it features all of the Harry Potter lore. The thing I'm nervous about is... There's a lot to be nervous about. You're fine. Yes, is that... Why are we in the role of witches and wizards working for this secrecy task force aiming to erase traces of magic from the muggle world? That seems to me like an angle of the Harry Potter universe that is like the non-fun angle. Like, hey, we're like the fun police here to kill the fun. We're not here to like embrace the magic community and be a wizard out in the world. We're here to to dampen down the magic in the world. It's so muggles don't know, Andrea. I know. They am I reading know. this wrong? You think? Am I reading the wrong thing into it? No, I, mean, I, I. That's what my question would be. What were you hoping for? I was hoping for just a true blue, like we're in the world of Harry Potter, out catching mystical creatures and casting spells. So like a Fantastic Beast. Go. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Hmm. I feel like that would be too similar to Pokemon Go. I think they're trying to That's make fair. it, like Steimer was saying, like more realistic and that the people around you who aren't playing still exist and they're the muggles. So you're in the know and anyone else who's playing is in the know. So you're kind of like in a secret club if you're a player. Yeah. But all the civilians and muggles still Damn exist cities. and you got to keep the secret. Yeah. Well, I feel we like not- that's what they're going for. It's true. Also, you were like, we were really excited about this. I'm like, I was not excited about um, this. Brittany I and I Harry were Potter, excited about I'm, this. I'm not yeah. excited. Yeah, Steinberg you, you know, rarely gets excited about anything for the record. Hey, that is not true. <laughs> that is just inherently not true. I'm, I get I'm excited. I'm with you, Steimer. I'm a huge Harry <laughs> Potter fan. Been a huge Harry Potter fan since, like, the first book came out. Um, and I was just like, cool, Harry Potter, go. I will. I will. <laughs> I will ride with you, Andrea, and also say I'm very excited about this. Wait, are you not? You don't have to ride with me, like, on false (laughs) pretenses. Hey, I'm a a ride or die friend here. But what I will say is... She never answered if she's actually excited or not. (laughs) I, Brittany, just answer the question. Are you actually excited or not? I I am nervously excited. Does that make sense? That's a no! That's a no! 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 I am going to play the shit out of this. I'm looking forward to playing this. However, my expectations are are just very low because of, you know, okay. what what Pokemon Go was when it launched. And Niantic can create a very fun experience. I spent far too much money on it. But it, it took two years, and we're still not getting everything that was promised in that launch trailer. All I'm saying. Also, I want to know more about this Avalanche uh, studio, uh, software. Avalanche software, I think, is what it was. The rumored Pokemon. Uh, Harry Potter game that... Remember yes, the that one looks memory. more yeah. more interesting than yeah. Di- different story. We'll have to find different out story. more about that, that some another time. That's maybe the one I'm very excited. Maybe about. we'll get a real that's... debut trailer at the Game Awards. Who knows? Oh man! Now that one, I will Ooh. go on record of saying I am very excited about that one. 
Yes, that would be very exciting. Never know. Ner- ner- nervously excited for this one. Okay. Well, be nervously excited. Um, speaking of nervous, I don't know. That's a terrible segue. Um, I'm just going to quickly run down some of the announcements that happened at the XO18, what happened last week. By the way, if you guys missed our What's Good Games crossover with Kind of Funny, uh, Steimer dubbed it the Kind of Good crossover. Um, it was a shit show we were not anticipating having to drink that much but because we opened up the stream for donations to kind of funny's extra life effort my kind and caring husband donated many hundreds of dollars for the big beautiful kids in the children's miracle network hospitals and because of that we had to drink shots of fernet fernet Fernet. Fernet. That's the word. Um, and when, it was miserable. I remember when John donated, we took the first shot. And then I remember toward the end, we took another shot. And I don't you remember You took a why. shot because all of you were wrong and I was right. Oh, that's right. That's right. true. Um, we're not going to go too far down the rabbit hole because we could talk a lot. And we have to end the first segment um, about that stream. But please, if you missed it, go check it out. It's a lot of fun. That's at uh, YouTube.com slash Kind of Funny Games. Or you can watch the archive at twitch.tv slash kind of funny games and i believe they uploaded our reactions as an individual podcast as well but just some of the announcements um void bastards was a new game that they announced from the one of the former directors of bioshock uh player unknowns battlegrounds is available on xbox game pass sea of thieves announced a new uh pvp mode Xbox One is getting mouse and keyboard support, which we already knew was happening, but they announced it with Fortnite and Warframe, which was very interesting. Uh, Microsoft also announced they acquired Wasteland Maker in Exile Entertainment, and they acquired Obsidian Entertainment. Plus, they gave a release date finally for Crackdown 3, which is coming on February 15th, 2018, and this week... They announced that Xbox Game Pass subscribers now have the ability to preload and pre-install games so that they're playable as soon as they're released. Yes, that this uh, Trish is clapping for people who are, wa- are listening <laughs> on, on, on audio. Um, let's see here. I have a quote here from Mike Yabara who tweeted, he, of course, is the Xbox Program Management Corporate Vice President. That's a mouthful. Um, one of the biggest asks we had for our Game Pass was to allow preload so you can download and be ready to play or to, and be ready the second launch happens. It's available now and starts with Crackdown 3 on Xbox and Windows. Wait, what does that mean? It's available now and starts with Crackdown. The preloading? I guess that means that they don't have any other new launches that are coming to Game Pass before the end of the year, which yeah, would make sense because the next, the next Xbox launch. exclusive is in February. But the next game pass game is Battlegrounds PUBG next week. Right, but that's not a preload because that game's already out. Does that make sense? Oh, I see what you're saying. You yeah, can yeah, already yeah. download yeah, yeah. PUBG on your Xbox. Yeah. You can't download Crackdown. Crackdown. Mm-hmm. Crackdown. So, Steimer, as our resident yeah. Crackdown fan, are you excited? I'm still, of course I'm excited. <laughs> I was like, the only one excited on the stream. I felt really lonely. But... <laughs> I was like, y'all were like, whatever. And I'm like, it's Crackdown. I'm so excited. Let's do Crackdown. Uh, but yeah, I I just want to play this game. I've wanted to just play this game for a while. So I'm looking forward to it. want to destroy things? I do. Crackdown is like, it's like one of those rage rooms that they have. Where you just get to break shit. Have you ever mm. been to one of those? No, but I really want to go. Do you want to go? Yeah, let's go to one. Okay. Ooh. They have to have them. If we're in Los Angeles. No, yes, they, they, absol- they absolutely have them in LA. I have already scoped it out. We will go. Okay, I love it. Perfect. Okay. Amazing. Okay, well, we're not going to go too much into any of these other announcements. Like I mentioned, we have to take a take a quick break, but it was uh, an interesting experience um, watching this live stream. I think our anticipa- or our expectations were set in the right place for the types of announcements we got if you want to hear the rest of our thoughts please do check out the episode that we shot with kind of funny games and on that note we're going to take our first break of the show sorry this is a long one the game awards of course all of those nominees uh we had to spend quite a bit of time on when we come back 
we're going to talk about what we've been playing. And man, Trisha, the list of what you've been playing is long. Um, so stick with us, it, ladies and gentlemen. Because I'm like it, very ADD with my gaming. I can't stay on one game. This is clear. Time. But you, she's going to talk about several games uh, when we come back right after this short break. Welcome back, everybody. It is segment two of the What's Good Games podcast. We hope you enjoyed that break. Maybe got yourself a nice, tasty beverage because we're going to be talking about video games that we've been playing. Uh, we don't have a sponsor for this segment this week outside of everything we talked about at the top of the show, meaning our fantastic merch store. Please, again, do go check that out. And uh, we mentioned briefly that Trisha had played quite a few games. So we're going to start with you. Which Woo! of these games would you like to discuss? Because I, I don't even know where, where to begin here. <laughs> okay, well, you know what? Um, I, don't, I, I don't know what you guys have covered on the show so far. Well, so we haven't really gone into Life is Strange 2 at all because we're kind of saving that for our spoiler cast, sure. which is going to happen right well, before episode two comes out. So we could, we could also, maybe skip as that. As you mentioned earlier, it's also only the first chapter. We need the whole story, I feel like, to take that. Um, so, I mean, I'll just quickly say that I'm super addicted to Cook, Serve, Delicious too. What is this game? No, no good reason. It is the most realistic restaurant sim that's ever I'm happened. I'm going to look that's it up now. say about the first Cook, Serve, Delicious, and this is the second one. It's it is. You're also playing Little Dragon's Cafe, because that's kind of, sort of, not, I mean, not really in the same realm, but it's also a restaurant thing. Well, it's funny because when I play Little Restaurant or uh, Little Dragon's Cafe, and I'm still in Cook Serve Delicious mode, the two don't jive at all. <laughs> like, Little Dragon's Cafe is very Harvest Moon esque. I'm just walking around looking at exciting things. I've got this little dragon I take care of. Oh, let me farm a couple of turnips and make cool food for people. But it's like very relaxing and right. fun and cartoony. Whereas Cook Serve Delicious is high stress. Move, 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 move. How fast can you memorize all the keys on the keyboard and like make it happen? And you can remap the buttons to whatever you want. So that's part of the strategy, but it is like intense. Those are my streams. If I stream Cook, Serve, Delicious too, where I like can't look at chat at all for <laughs> the purposes of the day of the restaurant. Um, but I love games like that. I don't know why. I feel like because in general in life, I operate best under high stress. Okay. So when I play games that put you in high stress, I'm like, yeah, I'm owning it. I'm killing this. This is what I do. <laughs> oh, my God. The uh, nachos in this game look amazing. They just put chicken and black olives and some guac. This food looks really yummy. I'm looking at this apple pie right now, and I'm like, oh, damn. Yeah, this game will make you super hungry. For sure, this game will make you super hungry. But, yeah, that's Cook, Serve, Delicious, too. Uh, it's not expensive. Go get it. The other one that I would say that I enjoyed more than I feel like the rest of the world did as we happy few. Did any of you guys get your hands on that? B, I did. Yeah, I, uh, I, I, I definitely got the glitchiness of it, but I enjoyed the world, and that's what I enjoyed from like the first chance I got to demo it, or when they first put it out on early access, and it was just a survival game. I was like, eh, the survival games part's cool. I like the aesthetic. But like, what, why? What's happening in this world? Why does it look so cool? So then when they came out with it and it actually had a story and had characters, I was like, okay, thank you for that. Now I'm on board. <laughs> uh, so I've been playing a bunch of that too. Yeah, I'm and at I'm a point okay with, with the glitches. Yeah, the glitches don't bother me. The part that bothers me is the kind of inconsistency or the imbalance in some of the way the mechanics work. For example, I am... In the city now, where everybody is on joy, and you have to kind of do this pseudo stealth of being on joy, and then the moment you're not on joy, you have to immediately find a way to take more joy. And the game doesn't overtly tell you about like how to pick up joy pills and keep them. And so I was only taking joy in like the joy booths which are kind of like mm -hmm. the phone booths. And so you have to find the locations of the joy booths on the map. And there's like no forgiveness. If you're yeah, in no. the city and your joy runs out, 
everybody immediately knows you're off your joy. Like there's no, there's no like, oh, I'm just going to sneak over to the phone booth and take more joy. If you don't have any joy in your inventory, like you're just like the whole city like, comes after you immediately. <laughs> and then conversely, yeah. if you accidentally take just the smidgest, tiniest bit more joy than you were supposed to have, you now have overdosed and there are side effects to being overdosed. And then you go into joy withdrawal. And I felt like the whole joy system was really punishing and really difficult to learn in the sense that the game doesn't really teach you how to balance that. Now, I'm sure there's probably somebody out there arguing, well, that's part of playing the game is to figure out the balance. But I played the game for many hours and never quite struck a, 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 a balance in that at all. How did you find it? Um, I am still struggling with that myself. I feel like that's the most difficult part of the game. Did you ever get to one of the other characters' stories? No, I was only ever um, on Arthur. Sally's story, when you get to control and play as Sally, is awesome. Um, so there, I agree with you. Arthur in the city is a big pain in the arse. Uh, <laughs> because if you run out of your joy, you're just sprinting to the next phone booth and hoping no one beats you in the process and trying to find <laughs> places to hide. And I feel like the part of the game before that really instills like, hey, it's important to hide, learn how to hide. And so you make use of that when you're in the town. Um, but in general, my, my thing that I'm enjoying the game for is the story and the embodiment of the different characters. So Sally's character, not to get too spoily, uh, Sally is kind of a pharmacist. So she creates drugs like Joy uh, that she can use to her advantage. Okay. So you kind of bypass the dependency solely on joy once you get to Sally, because I think, uh, what's her drug called? Sunshine. I think something like that. <laughs> that gives you like some of the more positive effects in the game of joy without a lot of the negatives. Um, and she has drugs that you can like slip in other people's drinks and it's, just, it's very clever. And then there's a third character you can play as as well, uh, to make the game complete and get the whole story. Uh, so I'm I'm playing around with that. I know a lot of people got upset about some of the glitchiness and some of the glitches are game breaking. Not going to lie. Like there's parts where you're supposed to be able to enter the next portion of the game. Like to do that, you need a certain item and you have the item and the NPC is still like, you don't have this item. And you're like, no. oh my God, yes you do. And it, like if you save and exit the game and then come back in, suddenly that NPC is like, oh, you have said item. And you're like, oh. Do you know the uh, game is still being patched and fixed and updated? Is it? That I don't know. I don't, I mean, I don't I was know. Wondering if it is. Let me look. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. I, I would hope so. But I'm like I would super hope so, aesthetic. Like I even have over here one of these. Oh, nice. You should just do the whole like, show with that. Yeah. Oh, God. Oh, that's <laughs> terrifying. So for people that are listening audio only, I have uh, the We Happy Few uh, Jack mask. The white so mask. Good. Yeah very creepy but yeah i'm enjoying playing around there um shadow of the tomb raider dead fire pillars of eternity 2 dead fire is great um and then after blizzcon i went on a, another diablo kick which oh, I tend nice. to do. every couple months i fall back into diablo and it's it's great i'm not mad it's great it's waiting <laughs> for me on my switch i mm. desperately want to play but i have all of these other current open world games that i should finish before i go back to playing diablo on my switch like what what are you playing right now um well last night i jumped back into red dead redemption 2 which we've talked about ad nauseum on this show obviously as most people are talking about because so many people are playing it right now and it's great even though brit i now know what you mean when you say you've reached a point in the story where you wish you had done more open world things before you had reached this point in the story. Because something fundamentally changes really about Arthur that will dramatically impact the way you enjoy the open world sandbox of Red Dead Redemption 2. So I would say don't rush your way through the main story if you are the type of person that really enjoys the sandbox. Spend more yeah. time in the sandbox and then the story will wait for you. Because we were talking about how... Um, Red Dead Redemption 2 and the exploration element of that game reminds me a lot of Elder Scrolls in the sense that you have to kind of really just venture out to that part of the map to see what's over there. You may or may not be ready for it. The story may or may not be ready for you. But if you want to see it and see what's happening there, you just got to 
go experience it and go go ride your horse over there. And I thought that's a really cool thing that they've integrated into the game. But if you wait to do that, obviously there are certain parts of the map that you have to wait to do till you get to a certain part of the story. But I wish I had done more open world stuff before because it's for reasons I can't explain. It's just not as fun Mm -hmm. anymore. And now I feel like I am on that fast track to just get to the epilogue. And that kind of sucks. But I'm here we are. (laughs) I'm so glad that you gave that tip because I am the type of person that will complete the main story before I play in the sandbox. Like I like to, I I like to get it done. Like I I got it done, checked it off. Now I can mess around. Um, So I'm glad that you said that because that's what happened to me too in uh, near automata. If anyone played that, you get too far in near and then you can't do any of the side quests anymore. I don't know how that works. I know that there are certain gang members, side quests, like people that are part of um, the Vanderlyn gang that you can't do after you progress to certain parts of the story, but I don't have a comprehensive list. I don't think it's as punishing as Nier's, um, but there are certain things that you just, if you don't do them while they're there, they just are gone. Yeah, if you see the white side quest bubbles on your map and you also have a main story mission, just for to be safe, do the side missions, do the white ones, because they will go away, obviously, for certain reasons at some point. So, Yeah, so but, I don't uh, want to say too much more about that, because no. um, I, I think we're venturing really close to spoiler territory. But um, I also have been playing a game that I'm super excited to talk about, Tetris Effect. Has anybody yeah. else played besides me? No, I get to play it tomorrow. Tomorrow morning, I host my show for New Egg, oh, and we're going to play it on the show. Good. And we're going to talk about it a little bit more when we talk about VR in the next segment. But, oh, my goodness. That I game. was not prepared for how fantastic this game is. And I think it's because every time that I saw it at an event or had the opportunity to maybe play this in a preview, I didn't because I'm like, it's Tetris. I know I'm going to like it. But I was not prepared for just how much I was going to like what they did with it. Because this isn't just Tetris with fancy music and light effects. The way that they've incorporated the sound design and the effect design into the gameplay and how it ties together is so comprehensive in a way that I was not expecting. So, for example, a lot of the levels are themed. So it's your basic Tetris column where you're, you know, stacking the Tetraminos to create lines and wave clear, right? Your standard Tetris gameplay. And then on top of that, the sound effects are tied to when you're rotating the Tetraminos. So as you like rotate each individual piece, the sound design will change as you're rotating and specific sounds will happen while you're rotating pieces. And then once you clear a line, the, the tetraminos that are in the puzzle will sometimes, depending where you are, will actually like do a 360 rotation. And it's like so visually cool to look at. And one of the levels that really stood out to me was a sand level where in the background you see these people riding camels. But then every time, you know, you're moving the tetraminos, you can like hear like the pressing on the sand. And then the tetraminos Uh. themselves are made of sand. And so the visual style of it and the way the music is so interwoven into it, it's just mesmerizing. (laughs) And I I fell in love with this game within the first three minutes I was playing it. I was like, I could put the controller down now and be like, I'm going to love this game from now until the last minute I play it. It's So did you play it in VR? I have not played it in VR yet. Mm. So, and I did that intentionally because I know that I'm going to love it more in VR and it's really good just on PlayStation 4. You can um, move the camera in and out, which by the way, if you are playing and you didn't know and you're playing and you were like, wow, the, the feel of which I'm stacking the Tetraminos feels so far away. If you press in on the left stick, if you go forward, it zooms in, pro tip took me a little while to figure that out for myself and I've talked to a couple of other people that are like oh my god I had no idea you could zoom yeah you can zoom in so don't worry you can zoom all the way in because that's a one of the VR features 
And you can also tilt it up and down so you can change your perspective with the camera, which is something you really haven't been able to do in a Tetris game before is kind of change your view on how you're looking at the field where the Tetraminos are falling. And then, of course, the, the music is really the highlight. And <laughs> I've discovered that anything above a speed 10 is just not where I want to be. Really, anything above a speed like 6 or 7 is not where I want to be. Your ass. Yeah, because there are certain sections, certain levels where you start out as a normal speed and then to clear off the, the wave because you have to clear a certain amount of lines to pass the level. Um, it'll There'll be like a music chime or a music shift and then all of a sudden they'll start dropping really fast. And you're like, oh no, oh God, what do I do? And I forgot how stressful Tetris can get. <laughs> It can be really stressful. <gasps> this is a prime example of one of those games that I had little to no interest in when it was announced. I know a lot of people lost their minds over it, but listening to everyone talk about it and the hype and the way you're describing it and the way that you're so goddamn giddy, like you rarely <laughs> get this giddy about a game. Andrea. That's true. <laughs> it's like, okay, like I could see, you know, come, going upstairs, putting on the big screen, cranking up the, the sound system because I'm very interested in the music and how it ties in like the things you were talking about. So, um, you know, I, I don't know if I can sit down Pokemon for this over the weekend, but you I do set aside at least an hour to play it because you won't be disappointed. There's this one level where you start out playing it and each of them have a visually very identifiable style and they change the color and the shape of the Tetraminos to fit the style of the level, which I love. And there was this one it kind of felt like I was at Burning Man and... Um, you get to like the end of the level and it, once it starts to ramp up to the difficult part, there's like these little people that are like almost like they're praying, like they're chanting there. So they're like going back and forth and they're chanting and like the more difficult it gets, the more people like start chanting what and it gets hell? like, and it gets like ritualistic in a way. Sorry, my camera. That's summoning the demon. It gets That's ritualistic. So weird. And like, it like, it gets you all hype and you're like, oh no, something's coming, something's coming. And then like the tetraminos start falling super fast and you're like, oh my yeah. God, what's happening? And like, it's just makes sense to me because it's, it's Mizuguchi, right? Like, right. Mm -hmm. he's so good at that. Um, and so that's part of why I do like Tetris is Tetris. I like Tetris a lot, but one of the main reasons why I want to play this game is because it's like his spin on it in a way. And he's always so skilled at, uh, fuck, I forget the word that it's called, synesthesia or something. Like, I don't, like, where you, it's visual and sound together. Mm. Um, there is a specific word that I'm just completely blanking on, but something like that. I don't know what this word now is. I have to, now I have to Google it. Yeah, yeah Google, Google it. it too. The, new, the new word that I feel like I'm learning right now is tetramino. I know, me too. I, that's, that was, yeah, I've not heard that one. Is that legit jargon? Yeah, Andrea? that's the name of the of the shape of the pieces in the Tetris puzzle. It's called the Tetramino. Where did you learn that? I mean, I don't know. A long time ago. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I want you to be like Nintendo Power Magazine. Oh, girl, I wish I had an actual legit good story about how I learned the word Tetramino. But I'm sure it was about a Tetris story that I did at some point in my career in games media. And I had to figure out the exact... Uh, nomenclature for those shapes but it does also appear in the game um several times if you're were or if you're curious as to like how you spell this word because in the they have um so they have a campaign that has these different sections and the levels like beautifully flow together but if you want to just do some free play they have a mode where you can do a variety of different types of free play which i thought was really cool so you can see what your friends are playing so if you go into like the, like I'm using air quotes here, like the multiplayer, because leaderboards, of course, is a big thing in this game. And you can kind of see your other friends kind of floating around and playing in, in Tetris, which I thought was really neat. And um, you can pick from a variety of different challenges. They have specific playlists. So they have like a sea playlist. So all of the sea levels or the ocean inspired levels are chained together that you can play. They have a wind playlist. They have a um, they have a competitive playlist where you're not playing directly against somebody, at least in what I was playing, but 
it's more it's, it's designed to be more challenging and I was like, I don't really want that. I just kind of want to put it on like a slow speed and just like enjoy the music. <laughs> but it's just such a well done experience. And, you know, Steimer, as you were mentioning, Enhanced Games, you know, uh, Mizuguchi's company just really took everything that they have done in previous titles and applied it to the classic Tetris puzzle game formula and really came up with something special so you may be asking yourself like why am i buying tetris yet again and i would say you've never experienced tetris like this because it's mizuguchi son yeah it's fucking it's, awesome. this is why i'm so excited to try it in vr but brit if you put this on your big screen and blast the music you were gonna have yourself an experience i'm gonna have myself a, cool. a police called on my ass but it'll be fine it'll be worth it no one can hear can you live out in the boonies yeah, no one will care. <laughs> and even still, like, they would be into the music, probably. The music's so really be, good. Like, they would gather outside my house and just start dancing. On my knees. Exactly. Yeah. Start a rave. I'm sure you guys have seen it, like, E3, those big uh, domes that they show off sometimes, where they essentially play the game on a big dome, and you're inside the dome getting the experience. I imagine this would be, like, the A-plus material for that. Oh, yeah. Mm. Oh, yeah. That would be very, very cool. Last awesome. night, well, yeah, I got to go. Review. Yeah, no, you guys got to go. Play it, buy it, do it. I was, um, <coughs> excuse me, last night I was about to say, I was at the Game Awards uh, re nominees reception. <coughs> Sorry, I'm choking on a pumpkin seed. Um, and uh -oh. <laughs> we were at Dolby and got to see. <coughs> She's dying. <coughs> Literally oh my god! Me. I can't, and, and it's sad thing is, we can't help her. She's alone. It's just her cats. And oh no! They don't, oh, they're, no. Just, they're gonna eat her face. <laughs> they're just gonna eat her face. Oh my god! She's gonna be like, oh, I need to eat. If I died on this video, chunking it, ch chunking, choking <laughs> on a pumpkin chunking. seed, that would be the saddest way to go. Um, it really would be. It'd be horrifying for us too, by the way. To oh watch god. me choke to death? Yeah, I would hope so. <laughs> yeah. I, I I couldn't watch. I'm sorry. I would be gone. I'd be drinking a fifth of whiskey. Maybe. Hopefully, one would of you would call my husband. Call, uh, either call John or call I the think, police. I or think like the police would be the best bet. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. I appreciate that you guys <laughs> have a plan. Um, anyway, my point was I got to see um, this giant movie screen that has Dolby Atmos built into the chairs. And you guys may or may not know that Dolby Atmos is available in certain video games and. They have an app on Xbox and PC that allows you to do Dolby Atmos in whatever headset that you have, which they gave me a code to try out because I was like, I didn't know this was a thing that I can download and get through my Xbox. So I'm going to try it and I'll report back. But it would be perfect for a Tetris Effect. Too bad right now Tetris Effect PlayStation exclusive. Um, but maybe someday I have to imagine it's Tetris that they'll probably be coming to xbox one and switch in the future but for now get it on your playstation 4 anyway Woo! other games that we should talk about to go to work tomorrow so yeah. thank you yeah <laughs> you're gonna have fun you're gonna be playing tomorrow and be like oh my god i was not ready yes that's awesome because that job uh we go live at 10 a.m and where they oh, film girl. is pretty far from where i live so I have to be out the door at 6 a.m. Oh, to, no. Yeah. So that's like my not not that the show is not fun because the show is fun. But I'm always like, Ugh, it's never fun to get up. That early. No, no, it's never fun to get up that it's early. So fun. I'm like now I'll, in addition to my coffee and my tired eyes, I'll be like, but Tetris effect. I had to get up around that early for my own wedding and I dreaded it. So it's fine. <laughs> it's, I get it. <laughs> but you could it's your wedding you could schedule it for later well no, especially since it was picture... like just the just a few of you it wasn't like you had like listen, 10 ladies, bridesmaids to do reason, hair and makeup for can... listen it's because the lighting in bora bora wasn't ideal i wanted the soft lighting not the harsh lighting okay okay I mean, honestly, that, like that that was legitimately the reason plus it was like 85 degrees by um like 11 a.m and being in your wedding dress in 85 degrees is not a pleasant experience wait so did you get married at like 9 a.m yeah, I think the ceremony was at like nine fifteen. Wait, or really? Something. That's it crazy. Was very, 
Yeah, yeah, because, <laughs> yeah, also you think it's very effing hot over there. Not that I'm complaining I got married in Bora Bora. Absolutely beautiful. Would recommend it. It was just, it does get very hot very early. And the sun and all the water, if you want that crystal blue water, you have to get in in the morning. That's what she said. Otherwise, the water doesn't have what? that aqua blue look to it. So if you want that in your photos, it does require getting up at the ass crack of dawn. Wow. All right, the more you know, I guess. From Brittany, if you're looking to get married in Bora Bora, Maybe reconsider. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't expect it. I mean, I didn't see that going that way, but I'm not surprised. I'm I love you very much. Wow. Maybe just, maybe just honeymoon in Bora Bora where you would sleep in and who cares what the water looks like. <laughs> yeah, not a bad idea. Yes. Um, but Brittany, you also have a meaty list of games here. So we obviously talked yes. about Moonlighter <laughs> last week. Yeah. Um, you have Fallout 76 here, which we maybe could potentially hold for next week. Um, That'd be better. And then only have a couple hours. You do have the brand new Tomb Raider mm-hmm. DLC, The Forge, and mm-hmm. Laser Suit Larry, Wet Dreams Don't oh. Dry. Yeah. How so I'm going, is that? So I'm going through this thing. And I call this the God of War effect just because this is the game that happened first. Is you play a game that's such a masterpiece that anything following up to it, if it's anywhere within the same realm of game or even not, it's just, it's not fair to that game. This happened with um, Far Cry 5. I played God of War and then I hopped back into Far Cry 5. So I told myself, okay, Red Dead Redemption 2, one of my favorite games now of all time. I have to do something very weird here (laughs) so these games will have a chance. So another game I'm currently playing that I can't talk about is the the Persona Dancing Collection, The Endless Night. So that's obviously very, very different from Red Dead Redemption 2, as are all of these games. So the Forge DLC, uh, Jason and I hopped into the co-op challenge tomb. And it took us about 30 minutes. And now where I'm confused, and maybe Andrea, since you did more work on this, you might know, what do you get with this Forge DLC? Is it just the challenge tomb? Because I've looked it up and I'm getting conflicting information. I'm seeing that you get new areas, new stories, new weapons, but the only thing I've seen so far has been the challenge tomb. Anyway, while you're looking that up. So it took about 30 minutes for us. They have different ways that you... So what this is, ladies and gentlemen, it's a challenge tomb, and you can do it single player, or you can invite a friend. This friend needs to have a copy of the game to play. So it's, you know, is it worth a $5? I thought they didn't have... I didn't... I thought they didn't need to have a copy of the game to play with you. I thought that was what they said. Okay, if that's the case, I didn't see an option to invite someone locally. The only option I saw was invite friends list, and then I was able to invite Jason when he was online. So that could be my bad... Someone please email email us and let me know if I'm wrong. Um, you can do I'm looking a score it up right attack. Now. Okay, you can do a score attack or a time attack if you want to participate on the leaderboards, or you can just do exploration mode, which is what we did. So you play as Laura, your partner plays also as Laura, but on your screen it looks like, oh God, what's the girl with the tattoos? We just saw her. Um, Abby. Yeah, I don't. Abby. Is it? Is it Abby? I think the it's girl Abby. wearing the hat. Yeah. Yeah. Abby. Yeah, yeah. Abby. So both of you play as Laura, but the other character looks like Abby on your screen. There was no combat or anything like that, but it was very much so a tomb designed for two players. And it was a really, we had a really good time with it. It was fun to put our heads together and see like, okay, so you're going to go to the left. I'm going to go to the right. And what do you see? Because you're not always in the same area together. Uh, You have to be able to communicate and communicate well and communicate healthy with this person you're playing with because otherwise you might (laughs) hate each other. (laughs) So we're just laughs. But you know what? Yeah. Otherwise, it could be frustrating. Like, this is not something you could do with someone silently. If so, you can do matchmaking where you're paired with a rando and you want to try doing it that way. Sounds like a disaster to me, but please, you know, good luck and let me know how that goes. But it was fun. It wasn't overly challenging or anything like that, but it was... uh, I really like the challenge tombs in Tomb Raider games. They remind me a lot of a, a sliver of what I like to see Zelda dungeons evolve into. They just have fun, intricate puzzles. You never really know what you're going to find. It, you walk into a room and you know you can solve the puzzle. You just have to figure out how to do it. And that's what this uh, Forge challenge tomb was all about. It was a really good time. I like to see Woo. Steiner and Andrea do it. Like together? Yeah. You guys can okay. do it together. Are you trying to make us hate each other? Yeah, no, because like, you ladies, listen, if you two can do Overcooked 2 together, you can handle this. Like, if you guys can do Overcooked 2 and not hate each other, you're fine. 
That's fair. Um, mm -hmm. So I didn't get a definitive answer here on if both people need to have the DLC in order to be able to play together. So this must be something I have to reach out to the PR team about and get an answer on. But if you know, as Brett mentioned, please do write in. I don't know if we're going to be able to touch on this next week or not. Who knows? <laughs> um, uh, but you liked it. it. Yes? Yeah, I liked it. I would recommend it. Like okay. I said, it's a good time. Again, just make sure you're playing with someone that you can talk to and maybe get a little frustrated with and not hate them forever. Uh, Leisure, suit, <laughs> Leisure Suit Larry. So this is the first time I've ever played this kind of game before in terms of like the Leisure Suit games. I am relatively new to adventure games like I've talked about on the show. So I'm finding myself a little overwhelmed with the puzzle aspect of this adventure game. Obviously, that's all this game really is. Because uh, at any point, you'll have anywhere from like 10 to 20 items in your inventory and they're all completely random and I, my mind doesn't think that way how you can you combine these two things and make it something that you need for this object that looks absolutely non-related to anything that you anyway so Simon and I demoed this together at PAX Prime yeah PAX, West? PAX West. yeah PAX Prime Excuse yeah me. or whatever they call it yeah PAX West yeah um so I'm four or so hours into this and honestly, the only reason I'm super duper intro into it is because I want to see what these games are all about, right? You know, Leisure Suit Larry has this reputation of being very vulgar and sexual and potty humor, and that's right up my alley. That's the kind of shit I love. And obviously, this is not a game you want to play with your children <laughs> around. But I haven't seen anything where I'm like, oh, my goodness, clutching my pearls. You know, nothing like that. And I don't know how well, the older games work. Um, side note. I found out about Leisure Suit Larry because my dad, also named Larry, was playing Leisure uh, Suit Larry when I was a kid and tried to <laughs> kind of be like, no, not right now. Daddy's having his game time. And it's so funny to think about how like 30 years later, I don't even know if my dad knows that this game exists, but I'm definitely going to send him uh, a copy but what's uh, if you guys missed it at our PAX West panel, we talked about your guys' impressions having just played it, uh, demoed it for the first time. Has it done anything to kind of change your mind at all about it? Or do you kind of feel the same? I mean, I, uh, it's hard to say because I'm enjoying my time with it, but I'm not playing this game to rack my brain. I'm playing it to kind of experience Larry, see what kind of these games are all about, right? So I am getting easily frustrated because, again, I'm very familiar with adventure games, and some of these puzzles are just like, how the hell would anyone ever think about doing that? Simon, I'd be interested if you'd play this because I think it would give yeah. you some good perspective on how – I'm not going to call myself dumb because you'll – You'll yell yeah, at me. you're not. You're not dumb. Like the, that's the <laughs> way these games are designed. It's absolutely mm -hmm. ludicrous. Like a lot of the puzzles are kind of stupid in that way. Like you're just like, what the fuck? Like what? How would anybody think to use these two things together? But as part of the appeal, is like you do weird combinations to see what works. Like one of the main pro tips if you want to play an old school like style adventure game. Just click every number one, click mm -hmm. everything to try and pick up as much stuff as you can to put everything together in the inventory, regardless mm -hmm. of whether or not you think it works. Like just put, just try, okay. try combining everything. So you need patience and time. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't have, well, I don't mm -hmm. have, I have patience kind of, but not a lot of time. So that's why I'm, I'm playing side by side with a guide, which is something mm -hmm. I really liked about, um, what was that last adventure game I played that I talked about on the show? Broken Sword. What I liked about that is had the in-game built hint system which is really yeah. helpful but this one doesn't have it so i mean you know it's fun i'm enjoy i'm laughing i'm chuckling again this is my kind of humor um so the premise is is that you are larry and you have gone forward in time you still think you're in the 80s and then you quickly realize that you are not you are learning what cell phones are what instacrap farce book timber all these fun plays on apps and your goal as of right now my goal is to have sex with a lot of women. So I raise my timber Naturally. score. So I raise my timber score so I can bang this one woman who works for prune, which is like Apple. And I okay. haven't gotten laid because yet. Because that is how real life works. The right. more people you screw, the more attractive you become. 
Yeah, exactly. The that, more and your Tinder score goes up. That's like the whole point of every leisure suit Larry game, though, is screw more people, yes. become more attractive, screw more people, repeat. Well, yes. so Larry's effing repulsive. God, he's gross. <laughs> there is nothing yeah. good about this man. I mean, not obviously from like a personal perspective, but he's just very, very unattractive and is just, ugh, I don't know how, ugh, anyway. Um, yeah. So, oh, you know, I bet you there is some poor soul out there who looks spitting image of Larry who's just crying in a corner not right about now the looks it's about <laughs> the personality I think it's no the listen skis. obviously it's definitely You're right the skis. The I'm super if, skis. if you are a Larry doppelganger I apologize I'm not, trying to, <laughs> I'm not trying to offend you, just sure. don't be as you don't pervy as Larry is don't sleep right. with a bunch of people to think that it's gonna make you more attractive it's not I mean, the well, way the world not works his perviest quality I feel like he just no. goes around saying inappropriate things all the time. Like, I personally think the Larry games are hilarious. Mm -hmm. I will play any Leisure Suit Larry I can get my hands on. I have not played the newest one yet, um, but I will at some point. I remember I did a stream a couple of years ago where I had my parents play Leisure Suit Larry on my stream. That oh, sounds and amazing. And I like, sat there and hung out with them. It was so funny. And my mom just had like a constant face of disapproval. <laughs> Oh, I bet my mom would super too. not She'd into be it. Like, the fuck is this? <laughs> my dad would be so into me? it. I gotta get my dad out here to do a stream with me. That would be awesome. But yeah, I, it's fun. I'm enjoying my time with it. It's uh, like I said, my kind of humor. If you're easily offended, probably shouldn't be listening to the show. But also, don't play that game. Yeah. yeah, I would say if like dirty jokes aren't your thing, definitely not your style of game. Right. And that's you know. fine. Just yeah. <laughs> But if you're maybe someone who has a that's what she said pillow, this might be maybe. perfect for you. Maybe you might have one. <laughs> <laughs> we Look love dirty that. jokes. Look at that, ladies. I just I just don't want to be Larry's sloppy seconds. That was only my thing. Um, okay. Brittany, we're going to put a pin in Fallout 76. We're going to come back that's to it fine. because as you, most of you know, we're recording the show on Wednesday. The game's been live only for not even 24 hours um, as of recording this. And um, we just need more time with it. And somebody had tweeted to me being like, why isn't there a Metacritic score for this? I was like, because they gave us preloaded copies of the game, but the servers didn't go live until the game launched. Because Bethesda has been um, really good about making sure that you know, the public has access at the same time press does. It was a big thing that they did a couple of years ago. So, pin in that, Steimer, you've mm. just barely dipped your toe in the Hitman 2 waters. Yeah. And here's the thing. I always talk about this game and how, like, I've never played a Hitman before, but I'm always very intrigued by Hitman because I like the idea. I like the way that they have built the world in a way that you can kind of do whatever you want in a certain way. Like, it's a nice sandbox style from what I've seen in previews. However, I will say tutorial system, not so great. Figuring out how to get into this is very difficult. So like I was just dumped into the first world. The really only thing it told me to do was to take out the cameras, which I was like, yes, duh. Okay. Um, so shot down all the cameras and then it was like, you need to get into the house. And I was like, duh. Okay. Yeah. Um, so like it doesn't, I want, I don't want it to do this the whole game, but I think it would have been a little bit nicer if it had maybe held my hand a little bit in this first level, because I've never played this style of game before. I know in concept how it should work, but even like, so when it goes to, okay, now you need to take this mark out and, um, there's like all these other people walking around. I'm like, what is the best course of action here? Like should, I I'm hearing hints of what the game is trying to tell me I can do for instance, like there was a call and someone's talking about the ventilation systems kind of fucked up. So I'm like, okay, so I guess if I found something poisonous gas wise, I could probably throw it through the ventilation system. I don't know where the fuck the ventilation system is. I don't know how to like, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how to do this. I see what you're trying to hint at me, but I don't know how on earth I could possibly make this happen in this amount of time. Cause there was also like, she's like, the, the mark is a woman and she's like, I'm going to make some tea. And I'm like, great. If I could somehow shimmy downstairs without being noticed, I could poison your tea. But like, that seems I, like a tall order. 
totally get it because this is when I played at PAX Prime. I sat with the developer because I'm just like you, Simon. I've always been super duper interested in the series, but I don't know how to play a Hitman game. It's just not, right. it, yeah. So I sat down with the developer and he walked me through a mission uh, where I ended up poisoning. Was it the race car when you were doing the race? No, track? no, no, I no, played no, that no, one. This, okay. This is just the first thing in the game, which is like a house and you're scouting for information. But, like, you find information and then people mm. come and you have to, like, kill now, one of them. Now, can you open – sorry, just real quick. Can you open your menu when you play and is there certain objectives that you can select or certain ways you can play that level that you can select? Because I feel like that's what we did and it did a much better job at kind of holding my hand and telling me what to do and how to do it. Maybe. It didn't – the game never told me that was there if it was. Right. <laughs> Which is sort of a missed opportunity. Um, yeah. But, no, I, I mean, I kind of opened it to see what the – what the um, button mapping was. Cause I was like, I picked up an object and couldn't figure out how to drop it. <laughs> so like, I figured that out. I was like, what the fuck? Put it down. Stop carrying Put around a car in. battery. Why are you carrying this car battery around this whole you house? You look so suspicious. Yeah. It looks like, really <laughs> dumb. And I was just like thwacking into everything. But um, <laughs> so the only person that I managed to successfully kill was <clears throat> not the person I was intended to. It was her boyfriend. <laughs> I poisoned a glass of whiskey and then just hid and then eventually was like you know what i'm just gonna get caught and die or whatever you know end game and i i did that um and now it's like you can restart from a checkpoint and part of me is like i might just play this whole thing over and try and figure out more of the other ways the game was hinting at me because like there was a there was a period of time before anybody's there where you can kind of take your time with the house but you don't know that when you're first playing through when you you have that anxiety of like, oh my God, someone's going to be here any minute. What do I do? What do I do? Right. But I think now I know where the actual game trigger point is um, for have signaling like the cutscene and having people come. So I think I'm going to take my time with the house, try and figure out these other ways of skillful, skillful, skillful murder and then see it again and like and go for it often. again. And Manually just save Manually save all the time. I don't know because like I think if yeah if you mess one thing up it's that's it's it man no bueno I hid in a closet for a very long time <laughs> and so, I just watched people walk by no I'm glad that you're like, bringing this hey, up man, though up? because um I remember talking about this after the gameplay demo and saying it was really unfortunate that I had to have a developer hold my hand I actually got a little angry at the dev because I was like yo let me try to figure this out on my own. If you have to sit next to me and tell me how to play the level, that's an inherent design flaw. That's a level design yeah. problem that you guys need to fix because people at home aren't going to have a developer sitting next to them telling them how to play. And I really love what Warner Brothers and um, um, is it um, IO, right? IO Interactive. Um, have done with the series and I told them like hey like you know this shouldn't be that difficult and I'm with you Steimer that they potentially should have just made a whole tutorial level but made it skippable right so if people played the first one yes. and played yeah. the reboot and understand the mechanics make the tutorial level skippable but make it you know m put everybody into it first so that everybody knows and then have like a narrator be like agent 47 could do this or agent 47 can do this. And so Even the if so, for instance, so I'm walking through the house, how it could have gone is like, oh, you see a bottle of poison and then it could be like note for later or like, you know, have a thing of like, maybe this would be useful. And then when the, the repairman calls about the ventilation system, have that pop up as an option. Like you can take care of people this way, like. So it's not necessarily telling you what you need to do, but it's giving you all the options. And it could also just be like, yo, or just take out your gun and shoot her in the head. Like I, whatever you want to do, man, like it's on you mm -hmm. to figure out how you want to do this. But here are some of the options. I think even just for the first level, that would have been incredibly helpful to me as a new Hitman player. And maybe what Brittany is saying exists and like that it's just not super clear that I can go into a menu yeah, my, and force that tutorial in. But my memory is, is that, every level has multiple things you can do in it, obviously. And if you right. open up the menu and you go to a certain sub menu, it shows all the different options, all the different ways you can play the game. So you can do it and you select that and it kind of gives you a checklist <clears throat> of the things you need to do. And I think it shows you little diamonds on the map of like where to go. 
Or mm-hmm. you can turn that off and just free play it and figure it out on your own. I think it should have done a better job of telling me that oh, exists sure. because <laughs> I had no idea until you just said that. Yeah, or maybe it hasn't unlocked yet because it's the first mission. I mean, I don't know. But like know, the first but... mission, what do you want me to do, man? Right. <laughs> she doesn't want the whiskey. She already drank the tea. All I have is a bottle whiskey, of poison. I don't know what to do with it. Yeah, I know, right? I'm not drinking your whiskey anymore, girl. I was, I legitimately was like, should I just walk out there and shoot both of them on the balcony? Which, like, um, I don't know. Which difficulty level are you playing on? I don't know, whatever. Casual, you think? No, I never drop it down to anything. I always just keep drop it whatever. It the, well, maybe whatever that might be the way to go till you get your feet under you to kind of figure out like how the world works and then drop and uh, then bring it up to professional. So um, Hitman has three different difficulty levels, casual, professional, and master. Um, and in the casual mode, they it's designed to give new players an easier way into the game. Uh, it'll give players a way to mess around with the world and see what happens without fear, fear of failing. The professional level is the default entry point, which is what I'm guessing you're playing on. Yeah. And it's balanced to give players a feeling of being a true assassin using all of the game's intricate mechanics together with their ingenuity to assassinate their targets. And I'm reading this directly from IO's website. Uh, and then the master, of course, is for players that need an extra challenge. Combat will be extremely hard and NPCs will be more aware of their surroundings, making stealth gameplay a greater challenge too. I mean, it did feel a little ridiculous that I'm like this dude in a suit and with a bald head. So it's shiny, right? Like, right. And then I'm sitting in a closet with the door ajar about yay big, which <laughs> is, uh, for those listening, I don't know, like at least a hand wide. <laughs> and someone is walking past it and not noticing that I'm just standing there being a creep. <laughs> I was like, that's weird. But <laughs> okay. Oh I also was waiting for, because I'm so used to how stealth works in a lot of other games, i.e. Tomb Raider. Like when somebody was walking by, I was waiting for a button prompt of like, stealth kill this man and drag him into the closet and that didn't come up i don't know if it's an option but i was like wait what why can't i just <laughs> why can't i kill you and put you here in closet land, closet land. <laughs> i don't know maybe i can but again as a brand new hitman player i found right. it oh, more overwhelming than i wanted it to be i wanted to just go in and like screw around and have fun in a sandbox but i found myself not knowing what to do being a little overwhelmed by choice, I suppose, is, is what happened. Instead of feeling like I had um, a lot of fun options, I instead felt like I had no options because I wasn't even sure what they were. I knew they right. existed somehow. Well, check out that menu and see if it actually exists. Well, that would be helpful. And it's also, you know, good criticism of their onboarding because they said um, on their statement here that Hitman has historically always been a hard game to pick up and we are taking steps to make the game more approachable while still keeping the core that current players like. We want our difficulty levels to offer something to both new players, experimenting players, and veterans. So that's why they've added this difficulty level system. And so clearly they are aware that players like you that are new, that are interested, are having a tough time, but it's clear that the game isn't directing you to be like, hey, are you new to Hitman? If yes, why don't you try this option? If no, baby here's yes, like us throwing mode. you in the d- in the deep mode. That onboarding right. probably should have been built into the very beginning of the game. Like when you're booting it up for the very first time and starting it up. Like that, that question should have been broached. You know, like pick this, pick this, pick this, pick your experience. So... Um, I hope you, you know, go back and try it again. My plan is to play it some this week as well. And so we can compare notes down the line, but, um, definitely, uh, want to see where they're going with that. Even though I've heard a lot of the criticisms say that it feels like Hitman 1.5, which isn't necessarily Mm -hmm. a bad thing because, uh, the first Hitman, they did a really great job with rebooting. So, but I just haven't spent enough time with it yet to really say much. So we'll put another pin in that conversation and you like to pick you that up. put a pin in it. Da, da, da. Okay. <laughs> oh, Brittany. I have songs in my head. I don't know what my problem is lately. You ladies will say a string of words and then in my head I want to I want to word vomit the songs and I don't know why. I mean that's just you, that's... girl. Just embrace yes. it. Okay. While she's embracing perfect. it, we're gonna take one more short break. <laughs> when we come back, 
We have a very interesting virtual reality discussion to be had. Stay with us. We'll see you in a minute. Welcome back, everybody. It is the final segment of the What's Good Games podcast. And this segment is brought to you by Patreon producer Lincoln Davis from Polyarc. So Polyarc and Lincoln Davis have been supporters of What's Good Games for quite some time, and we are very appreciative of them believing in what we do here. And if you guys have even a dollar to contribute to the show, if you like what we do and you're like, that's worth $1 a month, we would encourage you to head on over to patreon.com slash what's good games and check out all the amazing tiers of offerings that we have there and join our fantastic community. And today we are going to be talking about VR, virtual reality. So we have a couple of different topics we're going to be kind of kicking around um, some of which are the top VR games released in 2018. Of course, we're going to be talking about the Game Award nominees. Um, what game type do you see as sticking with VR? Every platform has a standout game type. What will they be for VR? And if you're not using VR, what would make you pick it up? Or maybe pick up the headset that you bought that you have sitting in a closet, like maybe my Oculus is doing right now. Um, <laughs> so... Um, thank you again to Lincoln for supporting the show. So let's start with the top VR games released in 2018. Now, the nominees are by no means a comprehensive list. There are so many more games that are not on this list that would definitely be considered top VR games. But just as a reminder, the five games that are nominated for the Game Awards in the VR AR category are Astrobot Rescue Mission from um, Sony Interactive on PSVR. Beat Saber, which is finally coming to PSVR on November 20th. So excited. Um, Firewall Zero Hour, which is also another PSVR game. Moss, which is now, I believe, multi-platform. Right? I think. Gotta double check. Sounds right. Um, and then Tetris Effect, which is currently only on PSVR, which I mentioned earlier I have to anticipate coming later they have not announced what the timed exclusivity is for that game but it's tetris it's not going to stay on playstation forever so man psvr they are sweeping it they really are and i think that that yeah. says a lot about how approachable that headset is for first-time users of, of vr anybody who has tried vr or is currently a vr enthusiast knows that like oculus and vive are clearly you know more powerful when it comes to hardware and specs that's just there's no debating that but they are more complicated to use and i think what's interesting about you know lincoln's questions um is you know like every platform has a standout game type what will they be for vr and i think that that kind of ties together this idea that vr has a lot of really amazing technical possibilities but is the most crazy technical thing the thing that people want vr for yeah I, so <laughs> just speaking no it's it's complicated because that's what she said no that's not what she said that's a relationship status anyway so when i first <laughs> i <laughs> keep going Brett. So keep good. going oh i'm going oh i'm this train is not stopping so when i first started playing vr i was playing anything and everything just for the sake of playing it because it was in VR. As time has gone on, I have found that puzzle, if I don't like a puzzle game normally, I'm not going to appreciate it just because it's in VR. I might appreciate what they've accomplished or what they're able to accomplish, but I'm not just going to play a game because it's in VR. The games I do like in VR are obviously horror experiences, which is bad and good because it's VR games and horror Absolutely no, it's only terrifying. bad, Brett. It's only no. ever bad. <laughs> terrifying. <laughs> oh, You're crazy. It, they are terrifying, and that's what I effing love about them so much. <laughs> and it it get, it brings a whole new level of in, enjoyment to the horror genre for me anyway when I'm playing a game in VR. As to what's going to stick, like Andrew was saying, I don't think it's the, the biggest and best and most innovative and whatnot. I think it's probably the simplest concepts like Tetris Effect or these other games, Beat Saber, something that allows you to just lose yourself with a puzzle or a simple gameplay loop or something like that. Not like, I think Resident Evil 7, really great in VR. 
but I don't think that's necessarily the future of VR. Maybe many years from now, when the technology has advanced so greatly that it looks like you're playing on a 4K TV, but all around you, I can see that. But for the near future, no. I think it's more of these puzzly type of games that we're seeing. I don't know. Why would I want a VR headset for like a puzzle game that I can have a very similar effect to on a 2D screen? Well, maybe puzzly games wasn't the right type of way to word it. I'm thinking something like, again, Moss. Like that was an adorable experience in VR, and one I'm I, I'm glad that I pre- I played on VR rather than on a TV. Now Tetris Effect, I'm gonna try both just to see what that's like. But I imagine that's another one of those experiences where it's like, oh my god, this is so much mind more mind blowing or something like that. Yeah, it's it's simple. It's, it's interesting thinking about about that because I think we're maybe getting into a little bit of subjective territory here, of course, as to mm-hmm. what is the best VR experience. Someone like me likes games that are simple, like Brittany's mentioning, because I've tried really immersive VR games and I haven't been able to fully enjoy them because something always breaks the immersion. For example, take a game like E! Valkyrie, which really kickstarted the VR video games movement back with their early demo on the prototypes of the Oculus Rift. Nobody was talking about VR gaming before that prototype was unveiled. They really were the gateway into what would become the VR community in video games specifically. But when I try to play that game, I'm overwhelmed by sensory bombardment and Space combat games are difficult for me to play even with a controller on a TV screen, let alone putting on a VR headset and really being immersed in it. I'm getting dizzy. I'm looking around. uh, The headset maybe isn't adjusted properly. Anything that breaks the immersion for just a moment ruins the experience because you need to be so fully immersed in something like that that's so intense. On the other hand, when I play a game like Moss, for example... I can kind of take my time with these levels. I can go at my own speed. I can like lean in and look at what's happening in the level. I can take the time and move my head around and kind of view the level from all the angles. And there's no pressure when playing that game. And I feel like there's so few puzzle games in general that allow you to take your time, even in regular 2D games that you're playing without a VR headset or 3D games that you're playing without a VR headset. That I love a game like that that's like, hey, we want to make you feel like you're inside this world and we're going to take advantage of the tech that we have at our disposal, but we're not going to throw every bell and whistle at you that's available because that doesn't enhance the experience. It overwhelms and detracts from the experience. Does that make sense? Mm Mm-hmm. Totally. Yeah. I I mean, I get to play a lot of VR games because of kind of the areas I cover tech and gaming. So it's the perfect amalgamation of the two. It's the perfect crossover. Um, And for me, the VR experiences that I enjoy the most that I feel like are probably the most accessible to people that aren't necessarily VR enthusiasts, but are just trying it are the experiences that seamlessly blend movement with the game itself and the VR experience. So Andrea, like you said, you know, when something breaks that immersion for you, It really does take you out of that feeling of being in in the game. And I think the games that are doing that the best right now are the more sensory experiential type of games, like a Beat Saber, like Electronauts, if anyone played Serviosis Electronauts, where kind of anyone can jump into the game and start feeling it in their body. That, for me, is the key. If you played a Sprint Vector, you feel that in your body. Um, if you ever played Echo Arena, mm-hmm. because we're, we've come a long way from the headset and the keyboard and mouse or the headset and the, can, the console controller. Now, now I think the struggle for devs is to really make it that immersive experience. And we saw a lot of really interesting peripherals like the Virtuix Omni. Um, oh, my gosh, that thing. Best. Whatever happened to it? Right? Whatever happened to that? I mean, it, there, there's a lot of stuff like that of people trying to solve that obstacle to VR of really immersing your entire body and all your senses. And I think that there's some games that came out in 2018 that are really doing that well. I do find it really interesting to see how VR is being applied into other areas. For example, I recently went on a trip to Copenhagen in Denmark 
And in Copenhagen, there is one of the world's oldest amusement parks, Tivoli Gardens, which is 150 years old, uh, which is kind of bizarre to think about, like, do I want to go on a ride that's been around for that long? Um, but they do have some I'm new sure stuff. I'm sure they do maintenance. Of course, of course. <laughs> one of the neat things that they offer is that you can pay an upgraded fee to put a VR headset on while you ride some of the rides. Oh. And in yep. my mind, I'm like, what's the point of that when I'm like already on the ride? It's already a thrill ride for me just being on it in real life. And I didn't get an opportunity to actually put it on, though I really wanted to. But several people it, on the ride that I was on did it. And it, this wasn't cheap. This was like per ride, like a 15 to $20 upgrade, like per ticket. Like that's really expensive. And these people would put on the VR headset and then get on the roller coaster and then ride the roller coaster watching something in VR. And I was like, wow. that Wait, I, like a regular, I, I like a regular it, like roller coaster. They would get on the roller coaster, everything. And then the technician would come around and put the VR headset on them while That's they were so seated. Fascinating. I, I totally see that get working that for um, yeah. like the mass effect ride that we went on. Right. Like that might, so like you're not looking at a giant screen because it's a little, if you're anywhere except for middle center, it can be a little crazy with the screen that wide. So I could see it for that where like your chair is moving, but you're have yeah. everything there. That makes right. sense. But a roller coaster is kind of weird. Yeah, I can see that only because uh, I just, I just covered it for the show I do for Newegg last week, but there's a company called Master of Shapes that combined go-karting and VR. So you're imagine driving a go-kart around the track with a VR helmet on. Sounds oh terrifying because you can't oh see Oh my God, yeah, nobody, everyone's going to crash. Bumper cars. Right, except for people don't. And they've incorporated like Mario Kart style power-ups and stuff into the track that like oh. you see through the helmet. Like you can see the power strips and stuff like that. And when you go over them in the game, your cart gets a boost. And like, like it was so amazing. Apparently, I didn't get to try it, but apparently uh, from some coworkers who did, they said it's the coolest thing they Field ever Field trip. Done. Right? And it's in Southern California. Oh, hey. Where it's done. It's, yeah, this company, uh, Master of Shapes, partnered with a K1 go-karting place nice. to do it. Um, yes, but yeah, so cool. So I can see, like, a roller coaster being enhanced by that um, because it is a thrill thing originally. But then you're kind of gamifying it, I guess. Yeah, yeah, that'd be interesting. I wonder if it costs so much because if it falls off your head in the middle of the roller coaster, it's probably broken. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely broken for sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, or, like, have any of you guys tried the Void VR experiences? No. That are around. I don't think they're, so. Mm -mm. They're around in, I want to say Disney World in Florida, Disneyland in Anaheim. And I know they had a setup at the Glendale Galleria here in Los Angeles. Um, but they had a Ghostbusters setup, a Star Wars setup, and they're, those are trying to tackle the immersion obstacle by building an actual physical environment that it, it's almost like an escape room type of thing or like a maze oh, type of thing. I've seen these. I've just never but tried it myself. On, yeah, you put on the headset and go through it. And like I did the Star Wars one and there was one point where I'm shooting my blaster and like in the in the headset, I see that there's a pole in front of me. And in actuality, I could grab that pole and hang off the pole while I'm shooting my blaster. Oh, because it's mapped to your in-game arena. It's mapped to your ah. actual surroundings. And so, See, that's so cool. That, would that be cool. was super cool, too. And they had moments where, like, explosion would happen and you would feel real heat from where the explosion happened. And just oh. people really playing with how much they can really put you in that world and in that game. And I just think that's so cool. I know the MGM Grand has something like this too in Vegas, where it's a multi, it's a VR arena where you go around shooting your friends. Z they have like zombie, zombie survival and stuff like that. And you talking about this reminds me of going to Vegas next week, and maybe I can see if I can get a session in. Anyway, get it. I, yeah, I think for me, I've always been the one on this show that's like, whatever about <laughs> VR. I don't want anything on my head. I don't want things in my head. I don't, especially not in my house. Leave me alone. But I do think. <laughs> Things that like Trisha, like that you're talking about sound interesting. The go-kart thing sounds really interesting. Um, and I like the idea of 
I guess I, I like it more when I can apply it to something more physical. Like I can, like if you're grabbing a thing, but you can grab it in the game and then it feels more immersive. I think for me, I'm like sitting alone in my living room with a thing on my head. It's not super appealing, but like doing more interactive things with VR does sound like it could be cool. Have you played Beat Saber yet? I play no VR things. Okay. Unless it's at a show. Next time I, I don't have when you're VR here, things. we will have Beat Saber in my house. And you will play Beat Saber in my house. And okay. I will also make you try oh, okay. Tetris Effect. And you will be forever changed. Yes. One of uh, one, my co-host, uh, Juan Bagnell, on the show I do for Newegg, he brought his headset home for like a big family get together, like grandparents, aunts, uncles, the whole thing, and just hooked up Beat Saber and was letting everybody have a try. And he said all of his family members, even the ones that know nothing about video games or technology, have zero interest, were like, oh, yeah, can I get another turn at that? Aww. Like, it was the gateway for all of his extended family members. So I'm always like, yeah, let's just try Beat Saber on people that are VR non-believers and see what happens. Hmm. I'm down to try. So this maybe leads us to the question. If you're not using the VR headset sitting around the house, what would make you pick it up? Steimer, as our People resident VR non-believer. No, come on. There's no experience. No, like I said, I, it, ha it would have to be a really unique, more interactive. At my house, I don't see what that could be. What, um, what about because... a Cullen dating simulator? No. <laughs> I know where you're going, but no. Like... I, I the that. only thing that I find interesting from a VR perspective in like in your house would be something that I would never play, which is what Brittany is super excited about, which is horror games. I can understand the mentality of like, ooh, this is dialing it up to 11, right? Like this is great. You cannot get away. Brittany likes to scream into her problems. <laughs> That's what I've said. And I scream away. But like it's, um, but so it's not for me. But I do think that that is an interesting application of that product in a home space. Uh, for me personally, I think I would be. I'm just much more intrigued by a real life Mario Kart thing with VR. That's so like something. outside experiences that take place in a big arena setting. Where yes. it's more Okay. What about if VR became nothing but a pair of sunglasses? But here's the problem. So both you and Andrea live in houses. I do not. Or actually, even Trisha, you live in a house too. Like, I don't live in a house. I live in a tiny apartment. Like you know. a lot of people do. Yeah. Like a lot of people. So I, there's putting the thing on my head doesn't help me much, even if it's just glasses. Like I want there to be more interactivity if that's what it's supposed to do. And I can't do that in the space that I have. Um, I would have to move everything out, which I'm not going to. Yeah. And and Okay, so even just like a sitting experience where maybe it incorporates like some sort of surrounding or whatnot, you don't even you don't want that either. You're like, I just you will only want VR if it's a big arena type area where you can actually move around and interact with your world. The point of VR to me is to have to mesh the worlds between digital and real and like mm -hmm. to have things feel um like you're experiencing something that isn't really there. So that's where I see the real world things that Trisha was talking about as being that. Like that is the application that I would want this for. That's, in um, that's interesting that you bring that up because that's exactly what I don't want from VR. Whenever I've gotten <laughs> ill from VR, it's because I'm standing and moving around. The VR experiences I've liked the most are when I can sit and feel like I'm grounded to the floor or to gravity is grounding me somewhere. And then I can take my time and look around and kind of experience the visual world. But when I'm physically moving around, something about it, like the disconnect in my brain or my equilibrium or balance or something's just not lining up. And like I tend to lose my immersion uh, from any little physical disturbance. Um, like when we got to, the three of us got to play Firewall Zero Hour together um, at either PSX or some other show. And that was that we PSX, were yeah. Um, and not only was I having just technical problems with the build that I was playing on, but it was challenging because like whenever I like hit the the edge of the, the virtual box or like I trip over the cable or something, it always 
breaks the immersion for me. And so like I don't get any joy or extra excitement out of moving around in a VR space. I actually prefer to have a world that I can explore in VR from a sedentary position. And I know that seems kind of contradictory to like the point of exploring VR worlds, but maybe that I'm just weird. I mean, I think that's no. probably where the tech is at right now. Cause it yeah. can, I think with a fire wall, I almost said firewatch. Um, yeah. It, that to me felt off in a way because of the movement speed. So like, I felt like we were moving super slow. I felt like we were walking through the mud, but <laughs> had they sped it up, we probably would have gotten sick. So like, it's right. one of those things that they're going to have to figure out. Um, and I will say maybe, maybe the reason why I'm always like sort of the Debbie Downer on VR is because I've already had the most optimal experience in VR, which is I played in the synesthesia suit with like four res with Mizuguchi. <laughs> I like, <laughs> I don't know how I can be, I can't do better than that. What if you got in the suit for Tetris effect? Oh, oh my girl. God. If he would bring that suit over <laughs> and like, yes, I would 100% get in that suit for Tetris effect. You know, it's interesting you ladies say that because I experience, I've experienced VR obviously both ways and I feel fully immersed no matter what I'm doing. So Samra, you know, it's interesting when you're saying you're sitting on a couch and you feel like you want to be in part of a world or part of your world. Isn't that a mermaid song? It is. Yep. It is. Um, I told you, man, I don't know what my problem is tonight, but <laughs> even when I'm sitting in a chair, not moving and just sitting in my computer chair, I feel like I'm like transported somewhere completely different. I feel like I'm not where I'm at. So I get that sensation no matter what I'm doing in VR. So it's interesting that we all have three very different opinions on that. Yeah, no, I just feel like I'm sitting on my couch with a thing on my face. <laughs> Right, and that's not how you want to feel, but I... <laughs> Perfect. Um, yeah, I don't know. To answer the question, though, about what... Because I also have an Oculus sitting right up there in my closet that I don't touch. Yeah. Um, like, what would yeah. get me to get that down and actually play with it? And I think it's more what Andrea was alluding to uh, of the accessibility and, you know, just how easy it is to use a PSVR, even though that's not the optimal experience. I've actually had the chance to test out a lot of Google Daydream and uh, Qualcomm processor standalone VR headsets where they are standalone. There's no cameras you have to set up. You don't need a fancy rig. You don't need to be plugged in anything. You legit just take it and put it on your face and can have an experience. Now, granted, because of the tech limitations of the time right now, those experiences you can have are not the most enticing. Pretty so basic, like yeah. Maybe four or five that you're like, okay, I did that. That was cool. And then you're kind of done with that. But if we can get the tech and the games that are available on PSVR, Oculus, Vive, and put those in standalone headsets, then I think we're getting somewhere. Because if you think about use cases like, I don't know, you're in bed with your significant other and they want to go to sleep, but you still want to watch something on Netflix. If you're watching on your laptop, like the even light. if you have earbuds, the light's probably bugging them. Whereas if you could lean over and get your standalone VR headset, pop that on and watch, Let's watch some movie, porn, you're not bugging anybody. <laughs> Same thing with like, if you could take your VR headset on a plane and just be like, here I am on a plane, six hour flight. That, my headset that's the plane. dream, right? So I right. got the really awesome opportunity to try Magic Leap one. And I don't know if you've gotten to try that yet, um, yep. Trisha. So this is obviously not VR in the traditional sense. This is more AR augmented reality. But that idea of putting a headset on and having like this little like like mini disc console that was like the size of of maybe what um, like an Ouya kind of right like a, something super small that you just like put in your pocket. Uh, obviously, it's flat. It l honestly looks like kind of like a Walkman. You still look like like the like the disc <laughs> the disc man or whatever. Um, just like this disc that you would like clip onto your back pocket and then you can move around in the world with the system. I think once VR actually gets to that wireless place, and I know obviously um, Vive is working on a wireless headset. Oculus is working on a wireless headset. I have to imagine that PlayStation is working on a wireless headset. Um, once we get to that where those wireless headsets have the power or at least even like three quarters to half of the power of where oculus and psvr are now because i don't think we're ever going to get like a high-end vive experience wireless because you're just have you have not, you tried but... the vive wireless no have you yes it's ces last year was it was um, it breathtaking and a magical 
it looks just like the normal vibe, which is a huge compliment. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, it felt just like the normal vibe. It wasn't, even though there's like a big thing attached to your head, it it did feel a little different for sure, but it wasn't weighted as uncomfortably as I thought it would be. And then there's like a battery pack that you need to like put in your pocket or put around your waist or your thigh or something. Uh, but I think the, pro not the problem, but kind of the limitation still with that, that's going to hold some people off is you still need the cameras. Oh, yeah, that's a huge limitation. That's a huge. So once we get to the point where it is legit standalone VR at the level we're seeing Vive and Oculus now, that's when I think more mainstream people are going to yeah. be like, all right, I can get behind this. And I think we'll get there. I think it's going to be like we thought, you know, what's an example of technology? Like, our not, graphics would never get better than a Nintendo 64. You know, our cell phones would never be able to have yeah. our cameras and the internet and everything there. So I think we will get to a point where we will have standalone experiences that will be twice as powerful as Ready Player the One. Powerful. There we go. That will that'll be twice as powerful as the VR headsets that we have now that are plugged into our computers. I think we'll get there. It's just a matter of technology and um, time. And that's also what I'm very I don't for. mean to interrupt you, Britt, but. Holy, holy shit, something happened with Trisha's signal. It looks like you have crazy face paint on. Cool. Oh, like that one time with me where oh. I was all like those colors and raving. Uh, I, it, uh, oh, Did wait, I you just, raving? you just, no, you just popped back in. Oh my God, it was so weird. I'm going to, when I'm editing this, I'm going to screenshot it and send it to you. It was <laughs> freaking me out. It was, it was, was crazy. Horrible. I thought you were going to say that the recording stopped, that it froze, and I was going to be very sad. No, no, but it is it is a perfect segue for us to end this segment. Um, this has been a really fun conversation, and thank you, Trisha, so much for lending your expertise um, coming from the technical uh, side that you have been obviously working on so many amazing tech programs over the years and being the host of New Egg Show and also Kingston's program as well. Um, and really just... This has been so lovely getting to chat. I could keep talking with you about games, what feels like forever, but you have a baby to take care of. You have to get up at 6 a.m. tomorrow morning to go shoot yet another show because uh, Greg might call me the busiest lady in the business, but I think that title definitely belongs to you. <laughs> oh, definitely not. No, you you guys, I feel like I see you at every, like, I, not at, I don't personally see you at every convention because I don't go to every convention. But, like, what's good is at every convention, you're at every award ceremony. Like, you guys are killing it, and you're everywhere. And thank you for being a positive force in the gaming industry. And especially it's nice to see, uh, you know, a an extra voice out there for the ladies. It's That's very thank cool you. to see. Yeah, it, it's it's – I feel like the more of us get out there that are other than the gaming stereotype that most people think of, whatever that other might be, whether it's – age, race, orientation, sex, whatever it is, uh, the more of us get out there and we're like, hey, I like games too, and I'm knowledgeable about games and can speak about them, uh, then the more that stereotype will start to break down and change. Heck, uh, yes. There's lots of people that love games, and so thank you guys for doing that and being that voice for the gaming community. You guys are awesome. Oh, that's really so sweet of you to say. Thank you. And, like, this has been fun. We would love – to have you back on the show sometime and maybe we could even arrange to do like a stream or play something together. Cause I would absolutely love that. Um, I would love that too. But for people who want to come find you and watch you, where are all the multitude of places that people can hunt down Trisha Hirschberger? Okay. So, uh, my YouTube channel slash Trisha Hirschberger is, mostly playlisted stuff that I host for other people with a smattering of original content, but it's kind of a good place to go for like what I'm doing on YouTube, which I do a tech show for Kingston called DIY in five that I write and do all myself. And it's basically like things that you may have heard about in the tech world, but don't really fully understand broken town very simplistically so that everyone can understand and talk about them um, or even do it yourself. DIY in five. Uh, so that's the show I do for Kingston and that's on their YouTube channel. And then, uh, the new egg show that I do is on YouTube, Facebook and newegg.com. And it's essentially the big, like 
sales now show like think like qvc but for new eggs so for the duration of the show and usually the rest of the day or until supplies run out we do like crazy deals on pc components so if you're someone who builds your own pc that's a great place to go and get those resources and we talk a lot about gaming because most of new eggs audience is their building pcs because right. they're gamers um so that's a really nice crossover and that's every thursday morning at 10 a.m and that's live and then I host a video game show for Geek and Sundry with my co-host Erica Ishii, who's absolutely lovely. And I She's know you great. Know as well. She is the best. Um, and we host that show at 4 p.m. every Tuesday, uh, 4 p.m. Pacific time every Tuesday on Twitch at twitch.tv slash geek and sundry. Um, and then I have my own Twitch channel as well slash Trisha Hershberger that I play games on whenever I get a chance to. Um, and like I kind of said earlier when we were talking, I, I have a hard time sticking with one game because there's so many good games that are out right now that I want to play that I bounce back and forth a lot. So I'm not a streamer that you'll go to to see the same game over and over. Uh, but if you want to be exposed to lots of different games, I tend to highlight indies that people aren't really talking about and stuff like that on my Twitch channel. So that's all there. Uh, and then, yeah, then I'm hosting a Focus Features sh show on Facebook as well where we talk about movies and stuff. But I think that's it. Oh, and Nerds with Kids. That's it. And Nerds with Kids. You remembered. You remembered. Nerds with Kids, I always forget. Um, that's a YouTube channel that I started with Lasercorn, formerly of Smosh Games. And I I'm love Lasercorn. Yay. Ian uh, is great, too. Yeah, he's awesome. And uh, he called me. That channel started because he called me. He was like, hey, you made a tiny human. I have a tiny human. We should get together and talk about our tiny humans and call it work. And I was like, that sounds awesome. So we got <laughs> Ivan in on it, and we invite on other guests that are mostly gaming content creators, to be honest, either gaming or comic book content creators that have kids. And most of us feel like you can't really talk about your kids in the stuff that we do because it's not cool. Like, it was a big fear I had that I was like, oh, man, if I'm public about being a mom, no one wants to listen to mom talk about video games. Like maybe I should never Dude, talk about that. I remember when you announced your pregnancy, <laughs> it was secret for mm -hmm. so many months. And then you were like, bam, I'm like eight months pregnant y'all. And I was like, how did she do that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I dressed to hide it. And I did a lot of shows where I talked from behind a desk or a table. Um, I, I figured out ways to do it, but I thought, then this was my own paranoia, but I thought, you know, if I have, if I give my audience less time to think of me as pregnant Trish and like have the baby and then get back to the normal content I was producing before, then hopefully it won't change my brand in people's eyes. That's what I was really worried about is that I've seen a lot of creators go from whatever they were doing before to a family channel and that's totally fine. It's just not what I want to make. I don't want to make that kind of content. I want to still be able to talk about gadgets and building PCs and video games and I didn't want the fact that I am a mom now to take away from that. Uh, so that's kind of what Nerds with Kids is all about, is like th there are so many of us that have kids and might feel a little timid about talking about it, but we have some problems that are unique to this business that, uh, you know, like can I play such and such kind of violent video game in front of my kid, and how do I explain that? And when your kids are older, like, do you introduce them to a game like Undertale? And what does that mean? Yeah, it's so a lot a lot of things like that. So that's a fun place too. And that's just youtube.com slash nerds with kids. Well, I would love to get you back on, if not just to specifically talk about that show, because that's a whole conversation I think that I would love to to deep dive into. Um, but Clearly, it is getting late, and you have a very early call time in the morning. <laughs> so thank you, thank you, thank you for making the time and for chatting with us about video games and nerding out. And hopefully, you guys will go find Trisha at all of her multitude of ways to watch content, whether you like PC games or you have kids or you want to watch about the naked truth about anything that she's talking about there or learn about the newest indie game on her Twitch channel. Um, thank you again so much for joining us. And don't forget, we will be recording the show early next week because of the Thanksgiving holiday. Of course, for patrons, just keep it uh, tuned to your feed at patreon.com slash what's good games. We'll get all of those pre-show details out for you. Until then, one last time, Trisha, this has been a pleasure, and we will see all of y'all next time. Bye, everybody. Thank you, ladies, so much. Mwah. <laughs>